This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, or good evening, or good morning, wherever you may be in the world. We are sitting here with this gorgeous little steamboat, the most calmest steamboat I have seen in a long time. And of course, this is your live safari, so welcome to the African bush. This must be the most relaxed steamboat I have ever seen. And I have seen this one before. This male in the exact same position in Philemon's Dip in Juma Game Reserve, South Africa. I'm starting to really like this steamboat. My name is Lauren. I do have BK on camera. And we're trying not to move very much. We're trying to be quiet because generally the smallest little antelope that we have in front of us can actually be very, very skittish. We normally don't get to see them too often or spend that much time with them because their behavior is very different from other antelopes. And I'm going to tell you all about that in just a minute. But I must remember, remind you all that we're live and interactive. You must talk to us. So kids all around the world, email us your questions to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv and adults, whatever platform you're using, please do send in your comments and questions. Hashtag Wild Earth or at FC in the YouTube chat stream. I've got a good feeling it's going to be a good drive today. It's very, very hot, 24 degrees Celsius and 75 degrees Fahrenheit which is actually not that hot for the African bush, but for winter, it is. So the steam box all alone, much smaller than Impala. So once you get, if you're an antelope, and once you get a little bit smaller than Impala, like dikers and steam box, it doesn't benefit you to be in a large herd. Not at all. It benefits you to be on your own. You blend in. This little steamboat, believe it or not, can flatten himself very, very flat and completely brand in, especially in the winter vegetation. You see, he's got his ears pinned back. Normally, they're upright. You see, they're pinned back like that. Very, very sweet. Oh, chewing on something. Chewing the cuts and resting. You see, so if BK just zooms out, you'll be able to see how camouflaged this little individual is. Many of you are seeing what a cute start to drive. Absolutely. But we've had this one just the other day in the exact same spot. It really hasn't moved position. They are territorial. So this must be its favorite little spot to hang out within its territory. Absolutely adore this little one and they do make the perfect prey for predators I'm afraid due to their size Nikki I have to say I agree with you I very much agree with you they're really large horns for such a small animal now they're known as a dwarf antelope because they are so small and the horns are very very straight with a sharp point at the end and they really, really are not tall. They're said to be about 60 centimeters up to the shoulders and weigh somewhere around 10 kilos. A very, very small animal. And you're completely right. Those horns almost look a little bit too large. Ah, what a great start to a great afternoon. Now I'm going to go and check on my mongoose family. And as I do that, we are going to send you across to Taylor with some elephants. We have, and I'm back at work, and we found one of the herds of elephants that move around 
Eco Training's beautiful Pridelands here in Baluli Game Reserve. It's the Elisha Keys herd, and off they go. But we'll catch up with them in just a minute. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is Khat. And like I said, we're driving around in the Greater Kruger National Park, part of Baluli Game Reserve. And it's such a beautiful day as well. A little gentle breeze, but clear skies, and of course, elephants all around us. So not a bad way to start the afternoon. The herd is quite mobile though. They, they're moving around and they've already been to the eco training camp to have a drink of water at their favorite spot in Lovu Dam. So now they're just sort of feeding and they've changed up their movement slightly since I was with them about a week ago, which is interesting to see. They are moving slightly more west now rather than doing their usual route around the, to towards the east and then back again. So it's nice to just catch up with them so that when we need to find them, we can figure out where they're off to. But I think from here, they'll probably head up past the train station and then back round towards Zebra Clearings, where it all starts again, and they'll come and have a drink tomorrow morning. So it'll be a good place for us, first thing. There's also a lot of grass around here. You can see not many buffalo and the big bulk grazers have been feeding around here. It's very tall still. And I'm sure the elephants will enjoy that. But otherwise, not really much for them to eat. All the trees have lost their leaves. <laughs> Jenna, yes, I was waiting for somebody to ask about Susan the elephant and where she is. I wonder, um, she didn't seem to give Mike as much trouble. But I know that he, he did have an encounter with her where she shook her head around. In case you have absolutely no idea what we're talking about, we've been very fortunate to see the same breeding herds over and over again um, here at Pridelands, which is something that we don't always get to see. They typically move off, they'll you know spend a couple of weeks and then, then off they go. But they've pretty much been here consecutively, uh, sorry, consecutively, consistently, with at least two of the breeding herds that we see on, on a different case. Susan, however, is a young elephant cow. Um, it's not her real name. It's just we see the same animals over and over, and it's hard to not give them a little pet name, but you don't have to use it. Please don't be offended. Um, she um, is quite a young Ellie cow, and she comes and she up to the vehicles and she shakes her head, not like these elephants that are just eating peacefully, minding their own business. She likes the attention. I uh, think she's definitely my spirit animal. Um, so she belongs to another herd, which we will go and look for a little bit later this afternoon. Khat will tell me where they were last seen and then I'm sure he remembers what their movements are and so we'll go and do that and if you did watch the sunrise safari there was a lioness that young lioness that was seen too so we'll try and follow up on her at some point I'm wondering if I I'm, I think I'm gonna move forward huh? just because these elephants are just about to disappear there's some more that are actually coming through seems like a bulk of the herd has already moved off and it's just the bulls now and a couple of youngsters that think that they're of independent age they're not. We'll have a look at this little one that's just feeding here. I was really hoping to get you in a glorious scene this afternoon, but I don't think that that's going to happen because it required the elephants to walk uh, a little bit further south. And let me see if I can go here. And that's not great. Sorry. We'll just see this little elephant. Sorry, I'm now putting Khat in a compromising position. Um, so basically, if they'd gone a little bit further south, it was pretty amazing though, um, because what happened, sorry, <laughs> getting used to the talking and trying to talk thing again, it takes a while, um, but basically the Drakensberg uh, lines up nicely with the hill and the elephants were moving in that direction, but they've now changed direction. Really little girl, she's taking her food with her, but we'll get that shot eventually, at some point we'll get it, it'll be the most magnificent animal and Drakensberg sighting you ever have witnessed. Off she goes. Well, she's also using that branch to swat a few flies. Very clever. If you and I picked up our food and used it to swat away the bugs, we'd be frowned upon. But, you know, for an elephant it's normal. Quite clever, actually. You can probably just hear the branches breaking every now and then. And now the whole herd has come to a halt. Hmm. Okay. We'll do a little loop around and see if we can get another view of these elephants. Or if you go to Nikki and he's dying to say hello to you. So a warm welcome to all our viewers. We currently here at Ambiond in Gala. Now, 
<laughs> it was so funny. Um, earlier on, we had some elephants that were just off to the left here. They've moved into um, some thickets, but we're going to try and see if we can maybe do a loop around and see if we can get another opportunity to spot them. Um, but joining me today with uh, on the camera is Owen. So on that note, I think let's quickly, you can see there's a bit of um, ears flapping in the distance, but what I think we, we're going to do from here is we're just going to slowly move back and see if we can get in another glimpse of this um, herd. It's quite a big herd. So just to show you, there's, oh, there's one that's moving into a bit more of an open area. You'll notice that big uh, figure moving from the left to the right. Now, it looked like there were quite a few from, as we mentioned earlier on, um, a couple of mothers with their youngsters and also quite a few bulls that were trailing them. So I wonder how big this herd might be. And also, they could have either come from water or eventually start heading to water. So it'd be really nice to spend some time with them. It's a beautiful afternoon. It's a lot warmer um, than it's been this morning. But you'll even notice with some of the trees around where those elephants are, there's quite a lot of the top uh, branches moving. So the wind is slowly starting to pick up. Um, and because of that, it might also later on force these elephants to move into a denser area out of the wind. But for now, it is still nice and um, warm. Just see those big ears like in the amongst the trees moving. But we, as I said, as we are going to try and reposition before we go on, I'm just going to ask Owen just to bring everyone back here just to show you this. What are we going to be doing this afternoon and, and tell you what our game plan is going to be. So there is a bit of shade. So I'm going to try and hold the map like this. So there's a, oh, I'm going to turn it like that. So basically we are right over here at this section of the reserve. So on the eastern side. So this is east, west, north and south. And I'm going to try and, and just use my hand from this side so there's no shade falling onto the map. But basically from here on, we're going to start searching in this area right over here and see if there's any signs of potentially leopard uh, this afternoon. So we said this morning, maybe we'll try for leopard. We weren't very lucky, um, but maybe this afternoon we could be, we could have luck on our side. So definitely that's our area we're going to focus on. But for now, I think what we'll do is let's even get another glimpse um, of these elephants. We'll try and move around. Alright, so I'm just going to start up the vehicle and then we can just reverse and see if we can get another look at them. Debbie, I'm glad you enjoy the map. I also enjoy it because then at least I can familiarize myself with the area. And it's also nice being able to tell a plan because, I mean, sometimes, I mean, as a viewer, it must be so hard if someone is driving and you don't really know what's going on in their head. Now, my thinking is it's nice and warm, so possibly something like elephants, uh, buffalo, more of the daytime animals that prefer to move when it's warm. It could be giraffe, zebra, and wildebeest. But I think as it cools down, let's try for leopard this afternoon. Ribbon is home. Ribbons at the den. The Juma clan matriarch is here. I have to say, she's a little bit nervous. She wasn't overly happy to see us here. And normally she's very relaxed. She looks skinny. And she's the only one that I can see that's at the den. This is Philemon's dip den three. No sign of Corky. No sign of anybody else, just rib robs. Queen rib robs. So I'm assuming that the cubs are inside. So I think this might be a drive of, well, patience, shall I say? A little bit of a stakeout, because I really want to figure out what's going on with the clan dynamics. If Corky has got a cub, and if that cub is also in the den, then it's going to be great to watch Corky and Ribbon interact. For those of you who are maybe just joining us, Ribbon, the beautiful hyena that you're currently looking at is the matriarch. She's a queen. She is the leader of the clan. But Corky was the ex-matriarch. It's a little bit of a sad story what happened to Corky, but she's still alive and well, and she's still very much part of the clan. But Ribbon has now taken over. 
And we've all, I think I can speak on behalf of most people. We've all fallen in love with Ribbon. She also has an incredible story of her own. Being the lowest ranking hyena, bullied. She's got a little injury in her ear that's assumed to be from another hyena. Lost many cubs. Didn't get good access to food. Didn't get treated very well at all. And she challenged the status quo. Climbed the proverbial ladder, shall we say. I love that phrase. And now she's a matriarch. Everyone respects her. And she has two little cubs, who I believe have been identified as two boys. Now, we're always very cautious with this because it's not easy with hyenas. But it looks like we're sitting with the assumption that the little cubs are two males. One is definitely a male. I wasn't entirely sure about the other one, but I think we've maybe had a good enough look now to be able to say that it's male. Oh, Ribbon, don't turn away from us. Now, in the summer, most animals would be hiding from the sun. But because it's winter, it's a cooler sun. Temperatures are really, really not that high. And therefore, most animals are enjoying being exposed to the sunshine, like the steambok and like the, well, like ribbon. So George and Jack, you're saying you haven't seen the cubs in ages. Well, when was the last time I saw them? I did see them the other night when I spotted Corky's little one. I have seen Corky's little one. It does exist, I promise you. And the cubs are around. Mm. Emma's reminding me, what would I do without you, Em? Yes, it was two or three nights ago. Very, very, I got called to come to a surprise. And my goodness, was I surprised. But the cubs are perfectly well, they're perfectly fine. I have a funny feeling Ribbon's moving them. What do you smell, girl? There's lots of impala behind us. I don't think they're too happy, but I don't know. Yes. Have you... There we go, PK, over here. The impala's just spotted Ribbon. Impala, she's been here for quite some time. I think you're a little bit slow on the uptake there. Can you hear them? That is a very angry male. <laughs> That's an alarm call, everyone. Two angry males, I can see. They have just noticed Ripon. She's been there the whole time. <laughs> Impala do alarm call for hyenas. I get asked that quite often and they do. Not just now am I witnessing it, we see it quite a lot. And this is an alarm call. This is a frequent, intense call or snort. And this is what we listen for and it tells you there's a predator around. Ribbon is not phased at all. <laughs> Sefa, I have to agree with you. The Impala are not very good security guards. We saw the Impala and I actually said to BK, oh, no one must be at the hyena den because look at all the Impala. And then I was surprised to see Ribbon. And obviously the Impala had not spotted you, girl. But you're not bothered, are you? No, I don't care. <laughs> the life of Rib Robs. But hyenas really don't get enough credit. They are incredible, incredible animals. And, well, Ribbon especially stole my heart. She stole it long before she became the matriarch. And we actually, without anthropomorphizing too much, wondered if Ribbon was a little bit depressed for a while. And I'm going to tell you that story just a bit later because Mr. Hendry is out and about and he wants to say good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's lovely to have you on board today. My name is James Hendry. On camera, 
We have got a Mr. Morgan Mulholland. Yes, I know. He sounds like a detective from Middle England, aged about 65. Wonderful name he has. I'm quite jealous of it myself. But he's actually from Hogsback in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. And what we're doing is looking for the Nkuhuma Pride, whose tracks I had in this block today. And in fact, this afternoon. Couldn't find them coming out this morning. So we drove to where we last had tracks. I went for a walk, I found one more track. And I thought we'd just follow them out towards the next road and see if they didn't terminate in a lion, perhaps. And they don't seem to have just yet. It's a little bit nerve-wracking, walking around in grass this thick with lions, or knowing that lions are around and not being exactly sure which members of the pride are there. So are there some little cubs, or have they been cosseted somewhere else? I'm pretty sure that they are in this block somewhere. But I'm not sure we're going to find them. I have that feeling. So I'm not going to spend all afternoon in here. Uh, Jonathan, yes, we are indeed by the Kruger. We are in the Sabi Sands, which is on the western fringes of the Kruger National Park. And it is privately owned, but connected. So there are no fences between us and the Kruger. So yes, we are in the Kruger National Park. You can see the landscape is very similar to the southern Kruger. Not very similar to the northern Kruger. There is no Mapani felt here. So we're in broadleafed Cumbretum woodland, which is common to this part of the low felt. The low felt being the low-lying areas in which we find the Kruger National Park and its environs. 400 meters odd above sea level. That's roughly 1,400 feet. They were pretty low down. Oh, I'm going to chop myself. Yeah. Let's go over to the Kalahari while I slice my legs open on the Zippos tree. Welcome again to another amazing, gorgeous, beautiful, stunning, spectacular, fantastic, marvelous afternoon at Swale Kalahari. Um, Jandre doing his thing on the camera there as always, and I'm just scavenging around inside here as always. Um, we're actually looking for, we got reports again, and we, uh, you know, I don't want to flog a dead horse there, but um, that female cheetah with the two cubs is actively hunting at the moment. So one of the tracking teams is actually just trying to follow up on it. So we don't want to go too far away. Um, but you can see we've got some chems back in the background over there, I think. Um, but while we're there, I just wanted to show you this amazingly special acacia, this one that I'm standing in amongst. And there's a very particular reason why I'm looking in underneath it over here. This is called a candle pod acacia, candle pot acacia. And what is really special, one, one, there's millions of things that are special about it, but one of the really cool things is, and I'm, I'm trying to find the feature that makes it so special. Okay, well, you'll see at the back over there, you see those uh, seed pods? Jandre, you got them? Well, I can actually try and find one a little bit closer here. Okay, here's one closer over here. Over here. This one here. See that seed pot? See how they all face upwards? Now, that's very unusual for most of the acacias. Most of the acacias actually have seed pods that are, are dangling down or they're like in amongst the branches and that. And what, what is particularly cool about this is that this is actually really advertising to animals, come get my seed pods, come eat me without breaking me up. So in other words, if you've got like your larger browsers, in, in this area, it can be eland, it can be kudu, it can be giraffe, things like that. Um, instead of like wading in here and actually trying to break branches to get to seed pods, they can just reach in, they're all actually standing up, nice bite-sized chunks, very, very accessible to animals. Um, so these animals actually, the plants actually get their seeds dispersed very, very easily, and then the, and the, 
uh, as well as not having a lot of damage. And the animals obviously benefit by having really, really easy access to these seed pots. So that's, that's just one of the things. This plant is one of my favorite ones on Swalu, and I've got, again, lots of favorites. But as a butterfly bush, when, when this has got butterflies on, um, I mean flowers on in September months, it is insane the amount of butterflies that you get off it. It's like swaths of these cream, uh, cream colored, very, very pale cream flowers. And it is just masses and masses and masses of butterflies. So let me extricate. Yeah, this is actually not as thorny as it looks, I promise. Not really. Oh, how I miss the butterflies. I was looking forward to winter, but I sorely miss the butterflies fluttering by. Not much has happened at my end. BK and I are thoroughly enjoying watching Ribbon sleep. We do it a lot these days. It's nothing new. Oh, just heard something. Ribbon never fully sleeps. She's always alert. Just like my dog, I always use this example. My dog will be snoring so loudly that sometimes we have to turn up the TV quite a bit in order to be able to hear it. You get up, you walk out of the room, she does not move a muscle. She continues to snore, but the minute you open the fridge door or the biscuit tin, she's right beside you. It's like magic. Science you cannot explain. I call it the biscuit in effect, but what I'm trying to say is predators will remain alert always. Ribbon's here. She's guarding the den. She's got cubs inside. She's alone. Any moment a lion could sneak up on her. So she's always alert with her nostrils and with her ears. She does close her eyes, but those two other senses will remain very alert. Nick, you're wondering about Corky. Corky's story was a very sad one. I think I mentioned that. And Corky was a matriarch. She was a great matriarch. She had a son called... <laughs> the Impala have spotted Ribbon again and are surprised. She was a great matriarch. She had a son called Plonk. And she got attacked by one of the Avokas. It was dark mean. And we witnessed it live. It was very, very sad. And she recovered. She bounced back from that. And she became, well, she retained her matriarchal status. But then again, she got injured and we were not sure what happened. There was some theories that it was internal, which means that, oh, Kampala, what do you see now? Which means that other hyenas within the clan caused her injuries. Or there was theories that it could have been the lions. This was when the Inkohumas were denning very much on Juma and they were around. Hyenas cannot control themselves when they smell something delicious. So Quirky could have possibly maybe just went too close to a cub or too close to a den. We really don't know. And after she was injured, she was really not very well. She lost weight, she lost condition. And I believe that Ribbon here, Rib Robs, seized that opportunity. Corky was no longer taking control, was not sort of holding on to her matriarchal status. There was trouble. And therefore, Ribbon, somehow, there must have been some pre-planning there, which, in my opinion, shows a great level, level of cognitive ability of hyenas, and decided, I'm going to take on matriarchal status. And instead of gathering a girl army, Nick, Ribbon gathered the army of boys, the males in the clan, and there was a huge war, a massive hyena war that happened outside all of our bedrooms. We all came running out in our pyjamas. It was rather entertaining seeing all your colleagues run out in their, well, sleeping gear and listened. And it was the most horrifying sounds. We've actually got a video of it somewhere. And that was the moment that it was settled and Ribbon became matriarch and it involved physical violence. June was hurt. June's now got a floppy ear. She didn't have a floppy ear before. Corky was hurt. Not too sure about heart. 
and Ribbon was in a good position because she had her daughter in Tima, who's now sexually mature. So it was a complete matriarchal overthrow, and it's an incredible story, and it's one that uh, I wish I could write more in depth about because Ribbon really, really did something very impressive. A similar thing happened with Waffles in the Masai Mara, but what Ribbon's done is extra, extra special by utilizing the males in the clan, the underdogs. She gathered them, she whooped them up, quite literally, and challenged the rest of the clan. Now she's in charge. I really want to see her and Corky together, but I'm just trying to see where those Impala are now and what they're snorting at. I don't think there's a leopard around. Any Sorry about that. But I am wondering if Corky's not too far away in another mound. There's lots of termite mounds here. Can you see the Impala BK? I've completely lost their visual. Are they just there? Yes, I think it is Ribbon they're staring at. I think they keep forgetting about her and then they see her again and get a fright. Good old Impala. But yes, Corky could be here, but we've not seen Ribbon and Corky interact since then. Is Corky now the lowest ranking member of the Juma clan? Or is she slightly above June? Is she still, does she still have a good relationship with Ribbon? Did she ever have a good relationship with Ribbon? We need to see them interact to understand that. And that's really what I'm waiting for. Of course, I want to see the cubbies, but I also want to see the adults interact and we'll be able to gauge quite a lot from that observation. Ribbon will definitely be dominant, but Ribbon's behavior to her daughter and Tima is very warm and tender compared to her interaction with other females. So you can really watch and gauge how close hyenas are. So we're gonna sit here just a little while longer and hopefully we'll see two brown heads pop out. Good afternoon from and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. My name is Damon. Behind the camera, we've got Marcel this afternoon. And we've come out into the plains of the far south of Pinder in search of a cheetah. And look what we found. Now, moments before you joined us, we watched this female cheetah try to hunt. There's a big herd of impala behind us. And we watched from a distance as she painstakingly stalked inch by inch she was probably within maybe 20 meters of the herd, but unfortunately she was not able to, to catch one. And look at her now, how she's breathing very heavily. See how her back is heaving up and down. She's panting, trying to catch her breath after that chase. And for those of you that have been joining us for the last few weeks, this is that same mother with the two cubs that we watched catch that gray Dacre about five days ago. So we have left the cubs, they're a little bit behind us here. Um, it was amazing to watch how, as this mother cheetah started to stalk into the herd of Impala, how her body language told the youngsters that it was time for them to stop following her, time for them to lie down and be still and let mom go to work. And like I said, she painstakingly stalked into the herd of Impala and the next thing we just saw Impalas spraying in all different directions you just hear them snorting, making that barking uh, sound. It sounds a bit like ba 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 ba. And they were alarm calling for probably about five minutes or so. Oh, but she's and she's. I. I don't think that they know that she's here. I don't think that. She, it's interesting now because just looking at her, everybody, she's lying maybe 30 meters from where from where the Impala are. Now, she looks like she's a little bit worn out, so I don't think she's going to try her luck again. But it's amazing that these Impalas are not even looking at her. They're looking down the hill. I think the cubs might have started to move. They've realized that, hang on, Mama's, Mama's been gone for a while. And if she'd caught something, she would have called us by now. I don't know if you can hear the wind 
it's quite a strong wind that's blowing from pretty much directly over this cheetah's head towards us and with the wind the sounds are getting muffled quite a lot and so perhaps the cubs are thinking maybe mom is calling us maybe she's caught something maybe she's got food for us and we just can't hear her so maybe let's go look for her and that seems to be what the impala were actually alarming at so i wonder if there wasn't a bit of chaos Next, you're asking at what age cheetah cubs will start hunting by themselves. Um, Nick, we started to see already at this age, these cubs are about six months old, just over six months old. And this is normally around the age where they'll start to to take or to kind of mom will give them a, a live um, prey item for them to play with and practice their, their skills on, practice their killing skills. Um, but then in terms of them actually hunting by themselves without mom, that's normally closer to independence. That's somewhere around 18 months old. Although it isn't unheard of for young cubs recently abandoned by their mothers, or, or sorry, orphaned rather. It's not unheard of for orphaned cubs, orphaned at an age much younger than that 18 months, um, to, to, to survive. I mentioned the last time that we were with this mother cheetah, there was a case where there was two brothers, two cheetah brothers, they were about seven months old and unfortunately their mother was killed by a lion and so they were were left to fend for themselves and they were able to survive from there but look at how heavily she's still breathing now it's not a terribly warm afternoon the sun is quite intense and there's a gentle breeze blowing that well not so gentle breeze but there's a bit of wind blowing so it'll help it will help to cool her down but it just shows the exertion that she's been through. And amazing to see these impalas behind us. They've all put their heads down and they've carried on grazing. I don't think they know that she's here. I think they were alarm calling at the, at the cubs, the cubs that are down the hill. And that is where the impalas that aren't grazing, the ones that are still staring, those are, or well, that's where those impala are looking at, at the cubs. And I wonder if they didn't maybe, maybe the cubs getting a bit impatient, maybe sitting up, wiggling their tails. If that might not have given the impala a slight advantage, because I thought that, that she was going to catch one. Everybody remarking at how beautiful she is. She is absolutely spectacular. Although I don't, I don't think I've ever seen an ugly cheetah. We're gonna spend a little bit more time, or spend a bit more time here, definitely. And we'll see, maybe she gets up and goes back to go fetch the cubs. Maybe the cubs come up to find her. We'll stick around here to find out. Well, it sounds like uh, everyone's having a cheetah afternoon this afternoon. And um, we may or may not be any different. Um, so I just wanted to show you you know, traditionally we say, well, cheetah don't climb trees, leopard climb trees, lions go up trees occasionally. And yet, a tree like this, that's it's got a bit of an angle to it, it's actually pretty easy to get up. Um, cheetah will often climb up into trees like this and actually scent mark. They'll defecate on top of these these big branches. They'll sometimes even climb right up into these, onto the top of these nests and then scent mark right up on top there. And it's a real feature, particularly in this area. Um, the southern Kalahari, these weaver nests are used a lot by cheetah for that purpose. Um, I'm just gonna, I just want to show you over here without falling out. It's very, very difficult to see, but there's actually cheetah droppings where this little piece of bark is sticking up over here. There's actually old droppings over here coming down. And you can, there's actually hair and stuff in it that I can actually see. So this is obviously not fresh, it's not recent, um, but it's just interest, interesting to note. So this branch that, that I'm standing on here, you can actually see cheetah have actually been up and down this tree. And that's pretty cool if you think, well, oh, cheetah don't climb trees, but they actually do. They're not nearly as adept at it as leopards, and, and even lions are way, way more graceful up a tree than a cheetah. Um, but it's certainly not uncommon if you're following cheetah to watch them getting to a scent tree like this, up and down it, playing around, and then jumping out again. Um, but they certainly, I've only seen on a handful of occasions uh, cheetah sleeping 
in trees on top of these weaver nests, which and that's pretty funky to watch. Um, but certainly they don't make themselves comfortable in a tree like a leopard does. A leopard is the past master of doing that kind of thing and that. So, but yeah, so it's just nice that there is sign around. Um, trackers are on the on the spur or the or the or the tracks of that that female the cubs, and I'm just hoping that we actually get some hunting activity this afternoon for you. Um, she should be quite peckish. Apparently, she caught a kudu calf. It was three days ago, so I think it was after the day that Jandra and I followed her. Um, so anyway, let's let's wait and see what transpires. <laughs> uh, grumpy old man. That, that, that's great. He says it's a scatter day, not a Saturday. That's very good. Very good play on words there. I like it. I'm trying to think of a comeback. Good luck with the cheetah search, Dylan. I have my spots, my sleepy, sleepy spots. Now, I mentioned earlier that at one point we really thought Ribbon was slightly depressed, and I know that sounds like I'm very much anthropomorphizing, which is something that is a bit of debate in the scientific community. There's a sort of spectrum. There is anthropodenial, which means you completely deny any sort of emotion to animals that relate to humans. So you would not say that animals can be happy or sad or feel things, etc., etc. And then there's anthropomorphism, which is when you maybe put too much human influence on animals. For example, a lot of people think that dolphins are always happy because they have a permanent smile, but actually that's just the way their mouth is shaped. They look happy because we see the smile and we think, ah, happy. But that does not mean that the animal is happy. So there's a spectrum. And I think it's great to be aware of that and to know where to sit on that spectrum. But I don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but Ribbon's behavior completely changed. And the only way we could slightly, well, we could think of to describe it was depression. And she had lost a cub. She really wasn't the same Ribbon. And depression is a word that's actually derived from Latin. I'm fascinated, like I love to know where words come from. And the Latin word is de premier, and it means to press down. So depression came from this because we're being pressed down, we're being weighted down with depression. And emotions involve relatively old brain circuits. So, through evolution, these circuits are shared among most vertebrates. And you really don't need a big brain or a complicated brain to feel angry, annoyed, or scared. You don't, you can have quite a simple brain. And a lot of experts do believe that emotions sort of originated alongside consciousness. So reacting is sometimes better than thinking. For example, if you see a predator at land or at sea, Rather than processing what you're seeing and thinking, gee, I better get out of here, it's better to react and just go or you will become someone's meal. So as humans, we know that depression is linked to hormones and I think it's something many of us are very familiar with and some of us may have suffered from. So we know what we're talking about when it relates to humans, but when it relates to animal, it's a very, very difficult subject. And there has been tests, especially on rodents, and I'm not saying this is right, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but it's available to read. And when a rodent in particular loses its drive and taste for sugar, they seek out dark spaces and they give up readily when presented with a challenge. Scientists believe that that rodent has shown signs of depression. So we really need to learn about brain chemistry to really be able to say whether an animal is depressed, but I guess you could gauge by behavior.
Veronica, no. Um, that would massively be anthropomorphizing if I thought that Ribbon was worried. I think that's a little bit bordering on human characteristics and putting it on an animal. But no, the hierarchy is established. Ribbon is the matriarch. And through everything that Corky has been through, I don't think Corky would challenge that. She's safe now. She's still part of the clan. She's protected by her female clan members. And she's now got a cup. It was definitely Corky with one cup that we saw the other night. So I really don't think Ribbon as, is worried at all. Look at her. <laughs> no, Veronica, she's not worried. She's very much aware of her position at the top. She's just being very lazy. And I really don't think that Ribbon is depressed or anything anymore. She's very much settled into her new role. Now, I'm going to take a bit of a risk, a bit of a bumble, and I'm going to come back to the den every 20 minutes. But it seems that Demon Cheetah could be getting ready to hunt. Welcome back, everyone. So, just after you left us, this female cheetah stood up, and it looked like she was about to go and have a second attempt at these Impala. Now, see how they're all kind of looking away from where she is and I don't want us to move because she's currently almost using the back of our vehicle as cover and so it's not going to be easy for us to get a, a shot of her for now um, but I'm hoping that she's going to sneak past the back of our vehicle and head towards his Impala. See the few that are staring at her? There's one that is looking at her and busy alarm calling. There's that sound that I spoke about earlier. But then the rest of them, are, see how they're all looking in the opposite direction. They're all looking down the hill. And that's where the cubs were. They're still looking there and still alarm calling there. So this kind of confusion might play into the hands of this female cheetah. Her cubs can almost cause a bit of a diversion for her. Might be able to see also the little warthogs moving around in amongst the impala. Or taking advantage of the safety and numbers factor. Samantha, you're asking if cheetah can take down bigger prey, such as something like a buffalo calf. Samantha, I have actually watched a young female cheetah attempt to catch a buffalo calf before, but it, it wasn't a very serious attempt, it didn't look like. Um, but Samantha, for a female cheetah like this, she won't normally try for anything bigger than an impala ram and even an impala ram like the one on the far left of this herd um, that impala is heavier than she is so even that would be quite a quite a monumental effort for her to bring down um, that being said though Samantha coalitions of male cheetah we spoke about, about male lions this morning and how more male lions would be more powerful and maybe able to bring, to bring down bigger prey that's certainly true in the case of male cheetah um, we've seen male cheetah here on Pinda coalitions of two. We've seen them take down something as big as an adult wildebeest, adult female wildebeest. Um, and even one ranger watched uh, the coalition that we've actually been seeing quite a few times over the last couple of weeks with Wild Earth. She watched them kill a baby giraffe. So, I mean, that's a pretty big animal for, for a cheetah to take down. Um, but for this female cheetah, an impala ram is about the maximum size that she'll try. But now they're moving away, and the fact that they're all looking away, see how they're all looking away from her, this might be good. It might mean that she's going to get a bit more emboldened, and maybe she comes out from behind the vehicle. Again, I don't want to move everybody, because if I do start the engine, it, if she does decide that she does want to take this opportunity, the starting of the engine might make them all look towards her. I think for now, the fact that these impala are so close to her and not alarm calling at her, I don't think they're all aware that she is here. She's kind of sitting very still in the shadow, so using good cover. Oh, and our hearts are just in our throats because of how close these Impala are to her. The other thing that, that we've realized is that if you look around this patch of grass, just in front of or between us and these Impala, I don't know if you can see all the rocks. There's a couple of little rocky outcrops. And now for a cheetah that relies on speed, and she's obviously finely designed to running 
at a very high speed and if she takes one wrong step in a rocky area like this it could be it could be very bad if she injures her, her paw and she's not able to to run properly it'll mean that she can't hunt properly which means that her cubs won't get food Jasmine, who is nine years old, you're asking how long it will take for a cheetah to recover from its hunting attempt. Jasmine, it will depend on how long the cheetah chases for. If it's a very quick little chase where the cheetah just runs out the bush and pounces on an antelope, then it will be pretty quick, maybe a couple of minutes, 10 minutes or so. But if it's a longer chase, maybe a couple hundred meters, it could take even longer than that. Um, maybe if it's very hot, maybe even after an hour, the cheetah might still be panting very heavily, breathing very hard. It very much depends on the conditions. And there's still those impala on the far left that are still alarm calling at the cubs. And they haven't noticed this mother behind us. I don't think it's gonna to be too long before she makes a move, but whether that's gonna to be to go and rejoin. Oh, she's going, she's going, she's going. She's about to come into view, everybody. She's stalking, she's stalking everyone. I know, I'm very sorry, we can't move just yet, but she's, my heart is in my mouth, everybody. She's behind a rock currently. She's just behind a rock, just behind our vehicle. If she takes one more step into the open, the impalas might see her, but... Oh, she's literally... She's literally 50 meters away from them, everybody. Gremlins General, you're saying that this is very tense? Gremlins General, my heart rate is absolutely going through the roof. I think my heart is currently sitting in my throat. Having to snatch at breaths every now and then. And she's got her ears flattened back behind her head, trying to make her trying to make her profile as minimalistic as possible. She doesn't want those impala to see her. And Jasmine, this is what you were asking earlier. You were asking how long it takes her to recover from, from a hunt. Jasmine, it's probably been about 25 minutes or so since she last attempted a hunt. And she ran pretty far in that hunt and she seems like she's already ready to go again. She stopped breathing heavily. And there's still one Impala that is looking suspiciously in her direction. But I'm not convinced that it has seen her. River Rat, you're asking if she's perhaps looking for a young impala or an injured impala in this herd. River Rat, she will most definitely be taking her time to scan this herd carefully to see if there is any impala in this group that's going to be easier to catch than, than, than another. So, for example, look at the ram. Even though he's bigger, look at how he's currently walking around and kind of moving the females out of the way. He's not preoccupied, not focused on, on his surroundings. He's focused on these females. He's herding them around. Um, and so that might be an opportunity for her. There are also, of course, the young of the year impalas, the ones that were born in November of last year. They're a bit smaller. If she is successful in capturing one, they will be, or that one will be easier to, to wrestle to the ground than, for example, a fully grown adult. She might be looking to see if there's any super skinny impala, maybe one that's diseased. Anything that's gonna give her a slight advantage Again, this ram is running around, trying to herd these females back. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but I know that the, the tension is easing somewhat, given that they're moving away. But I think that this is actually for the better. If she is going to attempt another hunt, if these impala move away from this rocky section, 
it's going to it's going to be better for her like i said she can't risk she can't risk injury here <laughs> there's still a couple in parlor that insist on snorting a few more times at those cubs oh, and then parlor's now oh there she goes 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 running there she goes oh my goodness there's the monkeys that I'm calling. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Oh my word. Hold on tight, everybody. It's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride to catch up. <laughs> Cindy, you're saying go, go, go. I'm trying to. <laughs> We're gonna try and catch up with her. She did cross this open area here. All right, let's get us out of low range. You can move it faster. Okay, let's see if we can spot her again. Oh my word, everyone. Marcel spotted her. There she is. She's moving through the open area. She's missed again, everybody. She's missed again. There she goes. We're just going to go a little bit further down the hill and then we'll stop and have a look at her. Look at the war dogs running away from her. And look at how low she's keeping herself. Keeping her head low. Not wanting to attract attention to herself. Oh my goodness. I feel like I'm just as tired as she is after my heart rate has been up like that for so long. Steph, you're saying you're exhausted? And I'm sure she's exhausted too. Right, we're going to try and catch up with her again. In the meantime, we're going to take a, a slight time out. And we'll send you across to a nice peaceful scene. Let everyone's heart rates kind of uh, come down a bit. Let's go see what Taylor's got for you. It's always funny when people use the word peaceful and then my name in the same sentence. Because it's normally not the case. But yes, I suppose if we're talking about the elephants, it is rather cool, calm and collected here. Except they're doing some destruction as some people may call it and i believe that yesterday you actually watched the elephants um yeah just to the west of leopard dam destroy this marula tree it's been sad we've had so many sightings here where we've had the elephants pushing and shoving one another feeding off of the marula tree and the leaves and now i don't think that this tree is going to survive i'm afraid it looks like they have completely ring barked it oh that was so cool did you see that elephant how he just used his tusk I mean, obviously we know that they use their tusks to slice through the bark, but it's not always, you know, a great view. You can see that elephant on the right is trying to do the same thing. It's actually very difficult. I think especially when your, cuff, uh, your tusks are quite curved like that, you know, you can't really slice underneath the bark super easily. But they just need to loosen it a little bit, uh, just for those little fingertips on the edge of the trunk. And then with all the power that they have, you know, Stripping the bark away is not really a challenge at all. These are just the bolts here. Here we go, you can see it doing it again. No, not using its tusks this time. Oh no, it is. There we go. It's trying desperately. There we go. That's crazy. I didn't realize how hard they really had to stick their tusks into the trunk of the tree either. Because you can actually, you can hear it penetrating through the hard outer bark. And then, um, and then sort of obviously hitting the inner section of the bark. There we go, and able to strip it away. 
That is another elephant pushing down a tree. That's what you can hear. That's not the, the sound of the bark. So we've, we've come across this breeding herd. And I have a suspicion that this might be the herd where my favorite elephants are. You can see with absolute ease as she pushes that what was a bush willow at some point in its life. The little one's just desperate, desperately trying to suckle, not really interested in eating anything at all. So I think that she will be going for the roots. You've come on, you can push that over quite easily. Yes. Pull it, shake it. No, no, you must finish what you started. Quantum, I'm not really sure what the um, the conservation sort of approach to protection of the trees is going to be here at Pridelands, but I have spoken a little bit about Elephants Alive, which is a um, an organization that um, protects elephants and does research on elephants, and they're actually doing a lot of studies at the, at the moment in the area um, on Jajani and I think in the Kasiri and and Baluli, where they have introduced um, bees to various trees, so they've you know put in little hives and the bees are living there. Whether or not that actually stops the elephants completely from destroying the trees, maybe, maybe not. I think it's definitely a deterrent. And then you get, I mean, goodness, you go into the Sabi Sand and you see all sorts of things happening where you'll have, um, you'll see random tin cans nailed to the trees where they've put, uh, it's a creosote, it is, yeah, yeah, which is something that we use normally to treat wood and to, is it for insects? And the, yeah, to sort of, per, in, I'm just confirming with Khad, because he, there we go, yeah, so he says treating the wood. Hello, girl, I will move for you if you'd like to, but if you're just going to stand there and let your little one suckle, we'll watch for a bit longer. Oh, here comes Susan, Khad, to the right. <laughs> There's my girl. Um, so, so they're doing a whole bunch of different things. Um, uh, so they do that, and apparently that smell is so terrible um, that the elephants don't like it, and it's a deterrent. And then another thing that they do is that they've actually been putting like a mesh, like wire around the trees, not barbed wire or anything like that, but just to make it difficult for them to strip the bark. So I don't know what will be done here, but it's definitely noticeable that some of the trees have been, um, yeah, really, really unfortunately beaten down by the elephants but it's just one of those things they'll move out of this area at some point they're not going to stay here forever <laughs> i believe i've broken the internet hello girl and what i'm going i just want to watch this elephant fine she's fine she's very relaxed you can see her trunk is on the floor her calf is obviously suckling but what i don't want to happen is susan to come and throw a tantrum by the vehicle which she's coming right up towards us now hello girl um, as she normally does, and I don't want her to row up this cow. All I'm doing, I'm just moving back. It's okay, girl. Just because we're on quite a narrow road and she's a stirrer. Susan, hey, uh uh, no, don't do that when there's a big cow standing next to you because then you're going to get me into trouble for no reason. So I'm just moving around there. Tell her, yeah, I've heard you've been making lots of trouble over the last week with people. It's not very nice behavior. I did um, see a very funny video where Susan actually, um, she riled up the whole herd and got the whole herd to rally against the car. So she is, she's a troublemaker. Don't come start your nonsense. I'm not, I'm not interested. Hey. Oi. Uh-uh. No. Not necessary at all. Again, I'll probably start the car just because the whole herd is moving in this direction. And there's lots of little babies. You see little ones, they're fine. The cars don't really mind at all you can see everybody's very relaxed with us but this is where you need to be careful because if one thing goes wrong obviously they're so social the whole herd rallies together and they don't care what the problem is but they face it together and that's what you don't want to get yourself into you don't want to get caught in a big herd like there's a bull that's you can maybe see him the tall elephant he looks quite aroused coming through the back so he might be a bit boisterous and cause a bit of trouble so you've got to look out for these types of things so always know what all the different elephants are doing you can see. Yes, Susan, there's a little one behind you. Don't trample, uh, trample over it. Isn't this such a nice sighting? She's very, she is definitely very protective over the youngsters. Oh, yes, she, yeah, she's helping that one by not letting it fall down. She's letting it lean up against her. Otherwise, it would have toppled on over. She hasn't had a calf yet. She's still a bit young. She hasn't got swollen mammary glands. So that motherly instinct is definitely naturally there for her. Just by the way, she spends so much time with the 
with the younger elephants. Those little ones want to go inside that hole now. That was also created by elephants. <laughs> yes, Tinkwad. Her tenacity is, is quite something, isn't it? Anyway, she doesn't want to let them go into that hole. So that, that, that hole probably was created by the elephants um, just by digging there. No. Susan? Susan? No. <laughs> ah, look at the little ones just rolling around. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. I'm not particularly worried. Like I said, she's she can be quite feisty, but she does like to just show off a little bit. Hey, girl. <laughs> I think she might throw some sand at us in a minute. But we're going to sit here and spend some time with this herd of elephants if we go across to Damon, where a very happy moment has just happened. Indeed, there has been a joyful reunion, everyone. Where you left us, we had one cheetah, and now that you've come back, there are three cheetah. So just after Mum missed for the second time this afternoon with a herd of impala, she started to call, making that high-pitched chirping sound. And out of the bushes came running her two little cubs. Now all sitting, all three of them, together in this open area, in the nice cool breeze so that poor mum can recover after that hunt of hers. And I've started my stopwatch, everybody, from the time that she stopped running. So Jasmine, age nine, we can time how long it takes for this mother cheetah to recover to the extent where she can walk again. And, well, that she's comfortable to carry on with her evening, rather. And Jasmine, I had wanted to talk more about what you, or the question that you asked when you asked earlier about how long it takes a cheetah to recover. And I said that it would depend on how long they, how long they ran for. And it depends on another thing. So I said that I've seen cheetah where an hour after the chase, they still look absolutely exhausted. And I'm just thinking, Jasmine, it was a very hot day when that happened, but they had also been eating quite a bit. And so sometimes, it, because when a cheetah eats, it eats a lot and very fast. And so they fill up their bellies very quickly and all that food going into their tummies uh, makes them get very hot. And so it can sometimes make it look like they are still recovering, but they're just really hot. So. I think the better answer to your question, Jasmine, the average... Oh, listen to the baboons calling in the mountains. See all the cubs have just looked off into the distance. So, Jasmine, I suppose the better answer to your question would be about 30 minutes or so is about the average. So, apparently the wind is just a little bit too strong for us to be able to hear the baboons but they are screaming and shouting up on that hillside in amongst the rocks. Probably went up there in search of food. Moi Noi, you're asking if this female cheetah, cheetah will attempt to hunt from the same herd more than once, um, and how many times she might attempt to hunt from that same herd. Moi Noi, well, we saw her now attempt a hunt on the same herd twice within the space of probably just over an hour. And in terms of the number of times that she will attempt a hunt on that impala, it very much depends. If this is the only herd of, of or this is the only sized animal that she can attempt to hunt, then she could keep trying with this herd of impala until she moves out of this area. Um, but obviously, that will de obviously each time that she attempts, it's, she'll be at a, at a bit more of a disadvantage because that prey will be just that much more aware of, of their surroundings. They will have had the shakes like we did. Alright, so we are on about 15 minutes since we watched her attempting to hunt and we're going to keep on monitoring her recovery. In the meantime though, let's go and see what Taylor's got for you. A 
I feel like the sighting is just, just getting better and better. We've now got the two little elephants. One which is learning terrible behavior from who I can only assume is her aunt or big sister. And then the other one that's just retired to the ground and decided that it's not going to do anything anymore. And it's just going to lay there. Fair enough, little elephant at the back. I would probably be doing what you're doing. Just sort of done with life this afternoon. So I'm starting to think, because it seems to be the same cluster of elephants that hang around together. Obviously, the, the two little ones that we're looking at, those two adults, the next sort of sub-adults, and then Madam over here on the right-hand side. And I, I wonder if they aren't all very closely related. Like I said, whether they're sisters or whether she's the daughter of one of these bigger cows. Oh, I don't know. Hello, <laughs> little one. Yeah, you're very terrifying. You're getting braver and braver. You, le you really are learning bad manners. Now, of course, this is always entertaining when they're small and young. But you wouldn't want a big elephant to do what this little one is doing. And has absolutely no idea what it's doing with its trunk just yet either. Uh-uh, girl. Uh-uh. That's not nice behavior. Sorry. For what? Your little one is just learning. It's fine. Just going to stop. But I don't know if you saw that. How, uh, again, I probably could have sat still, but it's an elephant cow, young calves around. When they decide to charge, they charge so quickly. And every time an elephant cow has charged me, there's been very little warning. So we don't want to play games. So we will just move back and give them space. Isn't that precious? It must be exhausting. Hey, imagine having to go around. And, you know, animals, they don't have the say like kids do. Do you know children scream and shout all the time and throw tantrums that they don't want to go places and eventually parents give in but you know with an elephant they and i suppose lions and leopards they don't tolerate it it's the adults way or the highway oh little one up you get it's precious though you can stand up. Now, if you have just joined us, don't worry, there isn't anything wrong with this little elephant. It's probably just a bit on the tired side and enjoying the nice, warm sand. <laughs> and now, a cameraman has just said that's the, that this does look like a little bit of a tantrum. Perhaps, what are you saying? That you don't want to go anywhere? That you want milk? Normally, when they're trumpeting for milk, they're quite vocal. And there's a lot of screaming involved. very playful elephants though today so this is the second herd of elephants that I, that I was telling you about a little bit earlier that we see on a regular basis and I think there's at least another two more herds that sort of pass through here but that, that hang around obviously we haven't been able to explore, uh, explore further down towards the east but we know that there is a small breeding herd there and there's a female elephant that has been collared and they're doing research on her I've forgotten her name but I have it written down somewhere it starts with an M. Do you remember it, Chad? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll remember it at some point. Um, is that Kumo coming in? Sorry, I'm also just looking around. Like I said, you've got to have your wits. And I think Kumo, our big elephant bull that we see with the collar, is about to join us too. But he's a bit far away. He's on the other side of the dam. Elephants all around. I hope that they stay. I hope that they stay forever. But they're edging closer and closer towards the northern boundary. I'll be so sad if they do eventually move off. There we go, good girl. I'm happy that she's moving away. She doesn't seem like the happiest elephant. I don't blame you. You have a toddler. There we go. Up off the ground and following mum. <laughs> and <laughs> so there's some, there are some old wives' tales about elephants being scared of mice, and you've asked if elephants are scared of ants. Um, I think what happens is that, if, considering an elephant's size, they do get startled quite quickly. But I don't think that it's necessarily that they're afraid of that thing in particular, you know. It might be, uh, you know, last minute that they notice that there's something running around at their feet, if something bigger than a mouse, of course, and that might startle them. But they're not petrified of them. I mean, I'm pretty sure some of you all have that, that relative that is terrified of spiders and how they react when they get a spider on them or a bug or something like that. So, you know, uh, that's allowed to happen to a big animal like an elephant too. But, it, it, you know, that type of thing is not true. Um, we have seen 
so many times on the dam cam. If you if you do watch the the dam cam at uh, Juma Private Game Reserve, elephant herds coming in and not even acknowledging what's down on the ground. I mean, sadly, we've seen them squash blacksmith lapwings, um, uh, chicks, little chicks running around, which is so sad. I'm sure they squash terrapins and tortoises. I've seen tortoises that have definitely been stepped on by elephants before. Whether it was intentional, um, like playing with them, or they just didn't notice that they were there, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, so accidents even happen even with these animals. Bye, Susan. See you next time she grew bored of us. I just think that this is so great. This is such a typical, I suppose, young animal behavior. Hey, something as simple as a hole in the ground. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> Providing a whole bunch of entertainment, hey? Who needs to buy children big fancy toys and shiny things, give them a cardboard box and a couple of containers to play around with? I know that kept me entertained, and it seems as though a little hole in the ground and a bit of sand will do the same for an elephant. I do hope one day if I am blessed with an heir that a hole and a stick will be all I am required to provide in terms of entertainment. There are some hippopotamus here at Biffles Hook Waterhole on the northeast corner of Juma. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, eight hippopotamus, uh, which is marvellous. And unexpected, I think. I mean, eight of them is quite a lot for this particular water hole. But sometimes there are none. Very nice to have them here. We have driven around, walked around, and found absolutely no further sign of the lions. And so we've moved on and we're sort of searching further afield in case they popped out of the block and we didn't notice. As Emma says, she's directing today, there's not a lot of social distancing going on with those hippos, no. They luckily don't go and catch things like bats to eat and give themselves diseases like we do. It's an immature ox picker on that one. There we are. You can see no colour on the beak yet, so that's a juvenile. Must be very exciting as a young ox picker, don't you think? When you wake up one day and realize that your beak's turning bright yellow and red in the case of the yellow billed ox picker, or just bright red in the case of the red billed. Must be a little bit like, I suppose, <laughs> waking up one morning and finding that you've got an armpit hair for the first time. Possibly more exciting for boys than it is for girls. I don't know. Same sort of thing, I imagine. You realise you're growing up, finally. <laughs> Hopefully, for the ox picker, it's a slightly less tumultuous time than it is for the human being. Yes, Ruth, it is a bit of a hippo party. Then, to the left of the hippos, we've got our friends, the Egyptian geese. Now, whether this couple's babies have grown up and disappeared and flown off, or whether they have once again failed to raise a successful flock, I don't know, clutch, sorry, I don't know. It's really spruced, I must say. I'm not sure that I've noticed how white they are on the forehead before. Very nice. And then there's a pied wagtail just behind them. Um, I'll just see if I can find him again. Naturally, as soon as I want to actually show him, he's disappeared. Wait, I can't see him. Morgan, I will tell you when I can see him, and then I shall point you in the correct direction. I think the record is around about 50 kilometers. I think 
think that's the sort of record distance that a hippopotamus has walked from water in the evening. But it's very unusual for them to do that. And in the Sabi Sands, in fact, probably the whole Greater Kruger, I'm not sure that you can get 50 k's from water. guys probably walk no more than five or six kilometers in a day, if that. Dylan apparently is also enjoying some water in the Kalahari, which uh, is uh, not that unusual given the amount of rain they've had this year. If we laugh, Jandre will... Apparently we laugh, but I can't hear a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we got here, just because everyone else is getting a whole lot of cool stuff like cheetahs and stuff, I thought, well, let me look at some stuff that's not laugh. <laughs> so over here, this is really cool. And it is cool. I know you may not think it's cool, but it really is. And why I wanted to show it to you, it's droppings. Okay, so it's okay, well, what droppings is it? Okay, it's jackal. There's actually a jackal track just on the side of it over here. There we go. Very indistinct. It's not too fresh. But what's particularly cool about this is looking at all the seeds inside these jackal droppings. Now, we typically think of jackals as, uh, you know what, we, as, car as predators, as carnivores and scavengers. So they'll go for meat, they harass lions around kills, they follow up on cheetah kills, they kill their own things occasionally, but they'll also take a lot of fruit as well. And um, the the seeds in here are from a species that's actually very common, either right, well, there's two different kinds here. There's one's right along the hill, very, very common along there, um, and actually quite high up, but normally on the lower slopes. And then there's another species, and the seeds are slightly larger way out in the dunes. But what this means is that you can infer just from this that these jackals are actually foraging either far away from here or right close by along the edge of the hill. So my money, just on the size of these little seeds inside these droppings, is that these jackals are actually foraging, or this particular one, was actually foraging right along the edges of the hills after these berries over there. So that's, that's, yeah, that's quite interesting. And just think, again, there's a... A fantastic dispersal mechanism. You, the, you know, the last thing you would think of for a, a, a plant to be dispersing itself is using a predator to do it. Here's a great example of that. The other thing that I want to show you here is if anyone's got any guesses as to what these droppings here are, and it's quite a cool one. I'll put a, I'll put a little pocket knife next to it so you can uh, get an idea of the size. There you go. Okay, so we're gonna shoot across to Pinda because they got something that's animate. <laughs> Welcome back everyone. And both my soul and my heart rates have calmed down a little bit from the action of a little bit earlier. And looking at the mother cheetah, just watching her breathing rate, it seems like she has also recovered quite well. And that's exactly 30 minutes on the dot since her chase. And her and her youngsters are busy resting. I think the youngsters more out of just wanting to be close to mom than out of having, actually having to need or having a need to rest. A little while ago, the two youngsters took a bit of a wander off to the right, exploring the grasslands, smelling some of the rocks and the logs, investigating their surroundings. And just looking at the spot that they're in, everybody, look at how nice and open it is. 
See how short the grass is? And so for her, having to keep herself as well as her little ones safe, I'm sure you can see how the sun is starting to set. I'm sure you can see the sun or the, the shadow starting to lengthen with the golden light. Uh, pretty soon, this mother cheetah is going to look for a spot to settle down for the night. I think with how open it is here, this is a perfect spot for her. Striped horse, you were asking how long does it take for a cheetah to digest its food before it will need to hunt again. Striped horse, if she can absolutely fill her belly, um, let's say for example she was able to kill one of those impala, that would definitely, any of those impala in that herd would have been enough to fill the bellies of her cubs as well as her own. And then she'd probably be able to comfortably go for three days without eating. Um, for those of you that were with us when we watched this female cheetah hunting and successfully catching that daker about five days ago, that was a very small, quite a small animal. And while the cubs' bellies were reasonably full, mom looked still pretty hungry after that. So I think between now and then, she has killed something else. So they've probably had a meal between us last seeing them and now. Um, but yeah, striped horse, about three days, they'll be pretty comfortable. Um, of course, though, if she is walking around and even if she does have a pretty full belly and she does see an opportunity that just can't be missed, it's unlikely to happen at this time of year, but for example, later on in the year when there's a lambing, if there's a, a lamb that's stumbling around looking completely helpless, even if she has got a pretty full belly, she might go and pounce on it. I've noticed though that, at least in, in my humble experience, I've noticed that cheetah tend to do that kind of thing a bit less though than something like a lion. Whereas I've seen lionesses with absolutely satiated, full, distended bellies go and pounce on a warthog just because it was right there. Just ignore it. I think pretty soon with the sun starting to set, uh, we might stick here for a little bit longer. Um, Sorry about that. I'm sure Dylan will be up and ready and sort those audio issues out, but don't worry. We're still sitting here with the last of the elephants and what will be the last of the marula tree at this rate. Well, it was actually quite interesting. What we've been just observing is this elephant cow, her calf, and then there was a really big elephant bull. And I, I, I must apologize. I thought it was Kumo coming towards us, but it wasn't. It was another really big bull. Um, I, have, I don't think I've seen him before. Um, and then also the terrorist of an elephant that causes all sorts of trouble, who seems to be flirting with this big elephant bull now, but we'll show you that now. Um, but they came here and they're all standing f uh, feeding on this on this marula for ages. So I'm just wondering if I can roll the car. I don't know. No, not really. Okay. She's coming back now. But she went off and she tailed after the... And we're talking about... Actually, look. I don't know if you can see. I wonder if she is coming into Estrus. So just through the bushes, there's the big elephant bull. And then to the right is dear old Susan. And they, since he arrived in the scene, he's been very interested in her. And she's been very interested in him. Now, you'll see the size differences. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite something. I don't know exactly how old Susan is. Obviously, we don't really know how old any of these animals are unless we were there the day that they were born. Um, but she, she, I think she's under about 10 years old, or at least coming into that sort of stage, which is a, a, about right for an elephant to, to um, sort of mate for the first time. He's very cu curious. I don't know if you heard the rumbling. The whole herd is giving off some very low sort of soft rumbles. I wish I could roll forward 
so that I can show you what's happening. But it's, you know, let me try. Let's see. Okay, do you mind if I go forward? Okay. Just going to go a couple of meters. And I'm going to go off to the right. Not the right, the other right, the left. Okay, here we go. Not the great, not the great. Sorry, girl, we're just getting a different position. So this is quite interesting. Hey, big girl. Sorry, I'm just watching this other elephant cow. No, no, it's okay. So you can see young Susan there in front and this monster of an elephant bull. He's about the same size as Kumo, and Kumo is a big elephant. Um, now, obviously the big bulls, we know that they eventually move off from the herds and they live a fairly solitary life other than joining up occasionally with other bulls of a similar age. And then when they get to sort of this, you know, late 30s, early 40s, they start moving around a bit more, passing through the breeding herds, seeing if there's anybody in estrus, and then obviously they'll mate with her. So, I don't know, we'll see now if he keeps tailing her. It's just funny how she was very excited as soon as he arrived. Oh, well, they, more rumbling. She's now charging over to a little elephant. What are you going to do to that little one? <laughs> She's like, I'm just going to go back. Okay. Hi, girl. So, I just want to give everybody room. I know that sounded very dramatic as the way that I reversed. But I just want to make sure I give them space as always. So that was interesting, hey? Her little elephant calf that she loves to play around with came back. She charged on over. Well, oh, she's back with the girls again. Hmm. I hope that we get to see her tomorrow and the day after. It'll be interesting to see if this bull keeps following the herd. Because then we know if he sticks with this herd, then there must be an elephant in estrus. Joyce, no, I don't think an elephant bull has to be in mass to mate. I think when they are in mass, they're just a little bit more driven and actively seeking out um, a, a, an elephant cow that's in estrus. So they kind of go on this mission of constantly um, searching for a cow that is suitable. Um, but if he comes into an area where there is a cow that's in estrus and he's not in mass, why shouldn't he be able to mate? As long as he's, he's sexually mature. Um, you know, this will be fine. And we, we, uh, sorry, so what, what am I trying to say here? Is that as long as he's sexually mature, which normally happens from about 25 years and up, and we know that that bull is much older than that, oh, they're going to, it's going to be trouble again. So I'll watch where that big cow goes. Hey, big girl. Yes, not you, little one. Don't come and cause trouble here, please, because your mom is going to be very upset. Hi, big girl. I'm not doing nothing. Only because big mother elephant stop teaching them bad manners. Oh, very exciting. I'm going to watch what happens here, but off we go uh, to Ingala. Seems as though there's a spotted cat and a kill. So remember we said this afternoon, we're going to try and see if we can find leopard. Now, we were so lucky that um, Barney went on earlier with two of the other trackers. Um, Richard and Ernie, and they've managed to spot um, this leopard with a kill up in the tree. So you'll just see, like, almost in the middle, it's hard um, to actually see the, the whole shape of it, but you might just notice the movement on the inside, and of course, the golden color and the black spots um, of this leopard. Now, it is part of, remember earlier on we, or yesterday, Barney said, uh, saw what was known as the Shitsalala Leap, um, which is the mother and uh, son and daughter uh, leopards that are often seen together. Now, this um, is part of that same group. And I don't know if it's the young sister or the young male that's currently feeding off the carcass, but it would be interesting to spend some time. Earlier on, we saw the mom in the drainage line right in front of us. Um, so it would be interesting to see if we give it some time. If this one would move a bit in the open so we can have a better look. Oh, there we go. But 
how amazing this is. It just shows you the the luck in the bush because I mean, we could have easily driven past here and missed this whole or this amazing sighting. But how they eventually found them is as they were walking, um, listening out uh, to any possible alarm calls. I'm listening out or seeing if there's any hyenas possibly following the leopard. And as they were trailing the tracks, they eventually found these drag marks that were coming down into this tree. And not even a couple of minutes later, hyenas came past. So they knew that the leopard was up. So they didn't even have to um, walk closer to in order to spot it. They just knew from the instinct that if there's drag marks, a lot of hyenas go in that direction that the leopard should be in the area. And how lucky are we? Because if that leopard was basically down from that tree towards the ground where it is, it's, it's in a quite a deep riverbed where we won't be able to get to. So we are so lucky that this leopard, even though it's so high up in the tree, we basically eye level with it at the moment. So just to show you, if we zoom out, now you'll notice just off to the left, there's quite a bit of a dark patch. Now that's... Uh, that's basically in that that drainage line. So a drainage line is just um, another word for an old riverbed. And I can't agree with the viewers in terms of the beautiful golden color and finding this leopard, especially where we um, are able to see it from here. Now, if we do have a closer look, you can almost see those long white whiskers, how they stain with blood. Um, it does look based on the size of this leopard, like the size of the face, like how delicate it is. I think this is the young daughter. Now, the male would slightly be bigger, but as I said, like it is hard to... So it is hard to tell from here, but I think while we enjoy this and we just spend some more time and see if there's any other opportunity to get a better glimpse of them coming into the open, we'll spend some more time. But let's head across to Damon at Pinder and hopefully we can have the same scene pretty soon. Welcome back everyone, you've joined us just in time. It seems like mum has recovered enough that she's even looking like she might invite some play from her little youngsters. Just saw her now stalking her daughter. That's the little one on the left there, the little female. And her and her brother have been busily exploring the surroundings while mom rests and recovers. And just now mom was, oh, mom's up. Yeah, a little bit of a stretch. And a look around. I so said there is there's a little bit of daylight left, but with it getting with it getting dark soon, she's gonna want to find a a safe spot to keep her youngsters for the night. There comes the young male coming to greet mum. Look at that, how cute is that? And just magnificent in this golden light. little cub exploring around him looking at and look how vigilant the mother is making sure that there's no danger I'm gonna have to reposition us ever so slightly everyone Lisa you're saying it's so cool to see cheetah Lisa I completely agree with you and it sounds like we've been having a pretty spectacular day so far with all the with all the big cats, lions and leopards and cheetah. There we are. But while we enjoy our cheetah, we'll send you across to Tualu to see what they've got for you. So we're doing a little scan around for these cheetah, and I think they're probably fairly close to us. But um, in the meantime, we've got this beautiful kudu bull, big kudu bull. He's about, oh, he's probably about. 30 meters up on the slopes, the lower slopes of the, these hills here. 
Um, but just be feeding very, very peacefully. Look at, look at those ears. He's actually tuned into us very well. But as Jandro zooms out, it'll give you an idea of the scale and also the camouflage of that animal. Look at this. And then he dis disappears completely. So in a straight line from us, that is probably about 380 yards or 380 meters, maybe slightly less, 350 meters. And again, that just highlights the incredible camouflage that animals have on these hills. And when you see these hills from a distance, you don't realize just the sheer amount of life that they're actually harboring at any given time. And that's a, that's a 250 kilogram antelope standing up there with a big set of horns. Um, you know, who knows what else is out there? Caracal, leopards, rock rabbits, clip springer, which is another little antelope, mountain reedbuck. You know, there's all, all sorts of things. Owls, there'll be lots and lots and lots of spotted eagle owls up in these hills. Ah, so we, we're getting back to the poop. Now, this is what I'm enjoying. <laughs> the kudu are great. So here's this um, piece of poop. And what did Carol want to know if it's kudu? Okay, it's not kudu. Um, I'm going to give you another clue now. Um, I'm going to put it to you. I'm just going to break it open a little bit. You'll see kudu would... Oh, Veronica says batty at fox. That's a good one. It's a good one, but it's not. So I'll break it open over there, and you can see. Uh, I'll, let me just come a bit closer. There. Jean-Dre, what's a good distance there? There you go. Now, if you look carefully inside there, there's actually little, what looks like parts of ants. There's like little legs and things. There's one that's just fallen off there, and it's mostly sand. So it's, it, it is incredibly difficult to see, but this is mostly sand and lots of ants inside it, bits and pieces of ants. Shanson has got it 100% right. It is art folk. Well done. Well done. Um, this is very old art folk. I'm not saying the art folk itself was old, but it's very old droppings. They're not fresh at all. But it just I happened to notice this while I was kind of scrounging around at the jackal droppings over there. So it just shows what's out here. Things that we, we're not even seeing at the moment, but they're out and about and they're around. It's like, you can barely even see that kudu now with a naked eye. Casting, casting a glance back over these hills here, you can just see how impeccably camouflaged that kudu bull is. Look at that, brilliant. That's camouflage. Even if you can't see it, that's the point of camouflage. So basically, all we can see is just a bit of movement in the tree. So I picked it up, nearly lost its balance a couple of times, but now slowly moving it. I think it's trying to find another branch just to put the carcass over so that it can probably just push down on it and then being able to, to feed off of it. So unfortunately, we can't see it now, but we'll give it a couple of min minutes and see if there's any other signs. I can still see glimpses of the leopard through the tree. You can see there, like just a bit of the spot pattern. How difficult would that be if you drive past to try and spot that within the tree? I mean, it's almost impossible. So what I might do, though, I am just going to lean forward to make sure that we don't drive over into this bank. I'm not going to go too close, but I'm just going to slowly edge a little bit forward to see if we can get another glimpse. So just bear with me if there's a bit of movement on the screen. But it's just to try and see if we can get a, just a slightly different angle on this leopard. All right, so let's try. There's not much we can see from here, but you can see the leopard, like, definitely inside. And I think it's just resting at the moment. So I think, and from there, we'll go slightly right. Probably that level and slightly down. Yeah, so a little bit down. Oh, there we go. You might see the back of the leopard. I can just imagine with this leopard feeding off of this, um, it looked like it could have been possibly a dike or maybe even a uh, bushbuck or nyala. I'm not too sure. It was hard, very, very hard to, to tell what it was. 
uh, from the angle we heard earlier, but I can just imagine under the base of this tree, there's possibly like some hyena. So they all they're doing is they're waiting for the scraps to fall down. As soon as the scrap falls down, um, they'll basically pick it up and quickly eat it. Um, and you can imagine with this leopard, if that carcass had to drop and there's a big hyena down at the bottom, that might me mean the meal is done for the day. Because there's no way that these leopards will be able to outcompete a hyena. Especially if it's a big grown hyena. Might just take the carcass and run off. But I think this leopard is really smart. It's just moving into another area where it's slowly, like, feasting away at it. So while we enjoy this beautiful leopard up in this tree, we'll give it a couple of minutes and maybe see if we can reposition and get another um, glimpse of the mother, possibly. We're going to send you back to another animal that looks almost like a leopard from a distance. Um, instead of having the rosettes, it actually has the spots. Okay, so these cheetah were probably lying about 100 meters away from us while we were watching those kudu. So, but anyway, great job to the trackers. They got them. And I think we found them in the nick of time. The royal we, of course. The trackers found them in the nick of time because they just starting to get active. And this is a really fun time to begin watching them. So this is one of the youngsters. And mom is the one lying that's just looked over her shoulder. Yeah, that's mom on the far side now. And the temperature's dropping. It's actually been a quite a warm day today. But as the temperature starts dropping, they're going to start moving and hunting. Jandre and I were very, very privileged this morning. Um, we actually viewed these cats earlier. Um, but in a completely different area, probably about two kilometers away from here. And um, just rolling around and grooming, and it was just incredible viewing. So that's why we thought, well, since we know more or less the area that they're in, we'd come back and give it a bash for this afternoon. But I don't think it's going to be too much longer before they actually get up and start actively hunting now. The nearest water hole to here, about a kilometer in a straight line. So they may go down there. Dizzy says, Swalu seems like better cheetah terrain than Pinda. Well, actually, I mean, you know, we, both reserves have got their pros and cons for cheetah. Um, Pinda's got these magnificent open areas down on an area that they call the flay. That is, like, absolutely produces sublime cheetah viewing, and you get these cheetah hunts from a long distance, so it's a very, very good area for viewing cheetah. Um, and then Swalu, conversely, has got these dense thickets in places that are not great for cheetah, but we've also got these massive open areas, the dune fields. So both reserves have their pros and cons, um, but they're completely different habitats. And the great thing is that cheetah are so well adapted to both of those. You know, they, can, they can function perfectly in both those environments. Wow, that is a magnificent sighting of a cheetah. That, that chest and and you can see that design that big deep chest for the lungs small head I mean you know compare it to a even a leopard's head relative to the body mass I mean this is a, a finely built animal this is designed for pure 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 speed and the way she's looking around like us is a good indication that she's going to be on the hunt very very soon A friend of mine came up with a very good question to me today, and I actually got it wrong. If you look at a cheetah like this, which side of that cheetah has got the most spots on? There's a question. Which side of the cheetah has got the most spots? You know, think about the answer and come back to me later when you got it. Yeah, she's going to be hunting. So I don't know what she's seeing here, but I mean, it could even be something up on the hill that she's watching way away. And unfortunately, you can't hear it with the mics here at this distance, but they've got this loud purring sound. They make a beautiful... ...to the mother. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
Janet got that spot on the outside of the cheetah has the most spots. I got that wrong. I said it was the backside. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the outside of the cheetah has the most spots. <laughs> I thought maybe the backside's got one extra spot, so maybe it had the most. <laughs> but yeah, she's definitely watching something up in that direction. There we are, my father, because my eyes. Mum and her two little ones look like they have settled down. And I think that just based on where they're in the afternoon, Mum's ready twice to catch some impala. Both times, as we as we saw, unfortunately not resulting in a successful, um, or hunts not being successful. So I'm pretty sure that with the sun now setting, that this is the spot that Mum has chosen to keep her little ones safe for the night. Like I said, the short grass, will afford her as many opportunities as possible to spot or detect any potential danger in the night, things like lions, leopards, and to spot here or smell. Just like last time, she's tried to hunt and she hasn't been successful. So I think tomorrow morning, this is where we're going to come. We're going to come straight back to this area tomorrow morning and try and catch up with her and see if we can maybe watch her attempt another hunt. Maybe she'll be successful in the morning. There's a beautiful moon that's starting to, well, that's come up over the horizon off to the east. Not quite full just yet, but pretty soon it will be. Emma's just saying that apparently tomorrow morning there's apparently supposed to be a partial moon eclipse. I did not know about that. I had to research and maybe even can maybe even try and film it, depending on the weather and um, if it will be visible nicely from the areas that we're driving in. But what a special afternoon it's been with this female cheetah and her two youngsters. The just amazing sighting that we saw, watching her try to hunt. Right, we're going to leave this mother cheetah now with her youngsters, let them settle in for the night. Like I said, we'll come back here first thing tomorrow morning. We're going to head out, go see if we can find some lions for you. Uh, and in the meantime, let's go and watch the sunset in the company of elephants and Taylor. It's nice to know that I'm not the only person getting tongue-tied, as uh, sometimes the ladies in final control do. <laughs> Makes me feel a lot better about myself. Right, so we're back with the herd of elephants. Um, the elephant that you can see on the left is that enormous bull that we were appreciating just a few moments ago. And he's just coming through. He's been sort of greeting everybody. He's not interested in the young bulls, but he goes off to the cows. He is, honestly, he's a beautiful specimen. Now look at that, how he's just blown some dust up into his face. He's also smelling something. So we were obviously talking about must earlier. Now, I think when the elephant bull does go into must, it's, um, oh, here's that elephant cow again. She just doesn't like me. Not not the little one, the, the bigger mom. I'm going to roll back, back slightly. Sorry, I'm without starting. Try to not disturb the scene too much because it is glorious. So what I was going to say about elephants, individuals, and must, is they must have some kind of sort of power over elephant bulls that aren't in must. We can smell them from a mile away, and so would uh, the elephant cows. And I'm sure it's like cologne, you know. It must smell really good. It must be a little bit more attractive uh, to the females too. But look at how all this dust is just capturing that light beautifully, creating this lovely sort of haze, very soft lighting now. This is gorgeous. Here comes another elephant to just fill the frame. Wow, that's pretty special. You don't always get moments like this where everything kind of lines up perfectly. I definitely know I don't have too many shots like this, so I hope that you're all taking screenshots. Look at that. If only we can have a little elephant just one more time walk through that gap so we can 
be prepared. Oh, here they come. Never mind. I'm sure you can also hear all the movement through the grass. I concur, Zephyr. Elephants, I mean, are enormous creatures, but it is nice to have that size comparison. That's why it was also really nice to have a size comparison between Susan and the big bull. But you get an idea of how big she is. She comes right up to the vehicle, and she's she's small. She's she's quite young still. Um, so she's nowhere near like the size of the elephants that we're looking at now. They're also standing up a little bit higher than us, so they're going to seem a bit larger. But it's the same thing, like, you know, a few times when the, uh, the safari guides have got out and stood next to trees where elephants were standing. Yeah, you you can't actually understand how large these creatures are. When a big elephant bull walks past your car, whoa, I mean, it's the most unbelievable feeling. It's a very humbling experience because, you know, at a moment's notice, if he wanted to, he could turn you over, but he doesn't. So it's always really special. It's a... A really special moment. We had Kumo just before I went on leave. He walked past the vehicle and it was, I kind of actually don't have any words to describe the way that I felt when he moved past the vehicle. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. Which okay. so, so this cat is now actively looking for prey. We determined that what she was looking at on the hill earlier yeah, are a number of different groups of kudu. It's unlikely that she's going to move up there and try to go for those. It's not impossible, um, but I don't think it's hugely likely. Um, there's hardly any wind now. This this wind has just dropped completely. So there's the most gentle, gentle, gentle of breezes. And the problem with that is it just swirls in amongst the bushes rather than being consistent from one direction. Um, and these cats do use wind to hunt. It really aids them a lot in terms of um, not disturbing prey. Um, but with a breeze like this, it's so soft. I mean, she could actually go any direction. My gut feel is that she's going to head out in the direction that she's looking now, but a little bit more to the right. Um, but that's I've got nothing to base that on. So I just wish you were able to hear now the purring. That's good. Just imagine a cat at home, those of you who have cats, but it's just like amplified, much, much, much louder purring. hear that <laughs> that's what it that's what it sounds like <laughs> that was one of my better animal noises sometimes my animal noises are horrendous we we actually came up from the direction when we were looking for it we actually came from that direction we didn't see any obvious signs of prey um Things like springbuck, impala, stembuck, but we could easily have missed those, very, very easily have missed those. And again, I mean, she's not completely reliant on larger game. I mean, she could be catching hares. Ooh, good stretch. The upward cat. That is a beautiful animal. It's like she's going to lie down again there. And the cub, cubs are egging on. Come on, mom, go hunt. We... So we're gonna we're gonna just stick with these cats. I really want to see if they actually begin hunting. <laughs> what a stroke of luck we've had. There is Shidulu, the leopardess. <laughs> I'm driving along, talking about lion tracks, and Mr. Mulholland said to me, there's a leopard. <laughs> I 
as if it was entirely, you know, what we see at this time of the day, every day. I'm just going to move slightly again because the light is slightly on the wrong side of the cat. Go ahead. Yeah, affirmative, I'm live. Go ahead with your message. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, the animal is now mobile into Vuyatela from just east of Junction Galago shortcut and Buffalo cut line. Sorry, everybody. Right, so, this is good news because she's heading into Juma. very kind of her to be sitting like that on a termite mound for us. Alan, you say you love it when Shadulu sits on a Shadulu. Well, <laughs> I've got to tell you, you've got to be careful of saying Shadulu sitting on a Shadulu too much, too quickly, because you could end up saying something you hadn't intended, and <laughs> that, that would be awkward. For those of you who don't know, Shadulu means termite mound. Somebody in their wisdom decided termite mound was a good name for a leopard. I use the term wisdom advisedly, of course. She's stalking something. I wonder if it is a bunny. Richard, it certainly is cat a day. Goodness, hey? You've had wonderful cheetah sightings. We've had nothing but barren wastelands until now. Right, let's move. Right, apparently it's so Catterday-ish that uh, this is not even the most remarkable sighting we have. Let's go to Pinder quickly. <laughs> Welcome back everybody. So from hunting cheetahs to lions in marula trees. And now the ever <laughs> The ever-present conundrum of how to come down. Look at this young male lion. <laughs> he looked like he wants to come down, and then he almost, almost looked like he pretended that he didn't really want to, just to, almost as if to save his dignity. No, I didn't really want to come down. I'm just feeling my way down the tree. So, having a look through my binoculars, everybody. Let's, and we can use the zoom of the camera. You might just be able to make out the scruffy manes growing around both of these young males necks and these are two members of the Bayala pride of lions and it seems that they are alone it seems that the fire they are apparently the, the other three youngsters are here nearby apparently but they are without their mothers and so very good chance that the two lionesses have gone off on the hunt, the two mothers of these young males. They've maybe gone off to try and hunt. They've left the youngsters behind knowing that at this age, these youngsters are not going to be of any help in a hunt, more of a hindrance than anything. They're moving around and playing could give away the game, give their mother's positions away. And so they've been left here, it seems, to their own devices. And boys will be boys. They've, it looks like they've gotten themselves into a bit of mischief. Debbie, you say you've called the fire department to come and get them down. Debbie, I hope that those firemen that are on their way have got very strong Kevlar suits. Because I think trying to grab a, a lion out of a tree 
I think that, yeah, you'll be, you'll come off second best. You might get bitten and scratched and clawed. I mean, imagine what a domestic cat does compared to a young lion. I mean, many, many, many times the size. But for these young lions, just imagine the, the view that that must afford them. Looking at the bush around them, can you see how it's quite dense? So by climbing up into those trees, they'll be able to see for a long distance all around them. Not only that, but I think there's a, a degree of fun in it for them too. They certainly, when they jumped up, they looked like they were enjoying themselves. Oh, here, you're gonna try and come down again? <laughs> He's overbalancing. <laughs> Shame. Now, of course, for these lions, coming down is not going to be as easy as coming out of a tree for something, or for, for a leopard, for example. Leopards, of course, with those fantastic locking wrists that enable them to come straight down a tree face first. For this lion, he'll have to either jump or come down face first. Okay, so breaking with the trend of the afternoon, while we wait for our lions to come down, we're going to send you across to Lauren, who's got a surprise for you. I do have a surprise. This is not a cat. This is the moon. Are you all happy with your surprise? 99.6%. Oh, I love that app. But I do have a surprise. Spots? Yes. Small? Yes. Naughty, yes. Cat, no. <laughs> Double trouble, are I? You, you're coming very close to the car. You're getting so brave. Yes. Oh, look, look, I can't believe this. Oh, what is this big thing? Probably smells terrible, doesn't it? Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it smells delicious to her, you know. You guys are becoming very inquisitive. Yes. <laughs> you can see they're developing that line of fawn hair and it sticks up. Um, hello, guys. You're going to be biting my tires before I know it. I love you both very much. And so do many other people around the world. <laughs> <laughs> that was so incredible. Oh no, I think we've possibly driven through delicious scat beaky. Can you smell that? And I think it's probably on our tires, which makes us very interesting. <laughs> Veronica, you're right. These are my new good shoes. I cannot risk. Uh, uh, uh. Where do you think you're going, guys? Well, I've lost these little cubbies under my car. <laughs> Smells awful, but we are going to send you over to a spotted cat up a tree at Ingala. So this young female leopard decided to reposition the carcass. You can see she's taken it all the way to the very top of the tree. And... Um, It'll be interesting to see what she's going to do from here because it's just like at the very top there there's not a lot of grip so one wrong move and she might even fall out of the tree with the carcass so let's just see how she's going to try and maneuver this but this is just such a special sort i can't believe it like i don't think i've ever seen especially seeing them at eye level like this being able to uh, move the carcass around like that because normally you always have to look up into the tree comfortable must that be like i mean she's just lying down on those um leaves on top of the branch but look at how she's just cleaning her lips like all the blood around her face just quickly wiping it now what i want to do is so have a look at, at the sighting that we're currently sitting in so i'm going to ask owen to 
Let's quickly show you where the brother is lying down. Oh, wait, let's... So from here on, so this is, we're looking at her right there. But let's get back to her and then we'll show you as soon as the brother moves. Because she's just moved at the back. Let's see if she comes back to the carcass. There she is. She might even pull that carcass down. I think once she fin once she decides to settle down, we'll show you where the brother is lying down at the moment. <laughs> Said I can't agree with you more. It is definitely high tea time with the uh, leopards. So I think oh, and this female is going to give us a little chance is let's maybe so basically from where we are sitting now so early on the young brother decided to come and lie down just behind me so i'm just going to focus just to show you where the young brother's lying down there he is and he's completely passed out you can see his eyes are closed he's breathing quite heavily just saying that he's So I think for now, let's spend some time here and see what's going to happen with them. She's hunting something here. She came running round the corner, jumped over a log, went round a termite mound, and then she sat down, and there she's waiting. I suspect it was something like a steenbok or a diker. There, look, whatever it is, it's moving. There's a stick in the way, but you know how it is with sticks. We just don't want to move too much. If I move forward, I'm going to block the view of the people next to us. And also, I could disturb the hunt. Jackal, if you're in the Maasai Mara, it most certainly is a safari without a stick like that. It's not a safari in the low felt without a stick in the way. There's a very good reason that you see very few wildlife documentaries made in the low felt of South Africa. And that's not because there isn't a lot of animal life and a lot of game. It's just very difficult to film because there's a lot of stick in the way. And so you'll see a leopard stalk and run. But inevitably, if they catch something, it's behind a bush. Same with lions and wild dogs and everything else. My oh, goodness, they're really... We don't know where to look today. Back to the Kalahari. We just had mom was heading towards the mountain. She was focused on something. We couldn't see what. Um, there are a number of kudu up there. They may have calves. We don't know. We just, from where we're sitting, we can't see them. Um, and the cubs came in from our left. And now mom's lost interest and is coming back. So whatever she was focused on up there has not proven to be as lucrative as she was hoping, I guess. Yeah, this is unbelievable. She might actually climb into this tree right next to the Land Rover. Let's let's hold thumbs. I don't know if she will. I don't know if she will. But let's see, let's see, let's see. She might do. She might do. She 
sharpening the claws. There we go. Look at that. Go on, go up, Mom, go up. One's going, this cub's going up the tree. And there you go. Great example of, of um, cheetah not climbing trees. I think that settles that. But remember I was saying when I was in that tree earlier, I was saying that trees that are at a slight angle are easier for them. So they're not nearly as adept in a tree as, as um, leopards are. But certainly they will go up trees occasionally. And these are sitting about five yards from us, literally. I mean, they're right here. But it was just really, really good to see the mom sharpening her claws like it. So even though they are, they stay out the entire time for her running, it's still, she, they still need to be maintained, kept in good condition. Lizzie says, cheetah are spectacular, and that they are. There is no question about that. I mean, everything about these cats just screams perfect design. Except when you step on a thorn, but that's not their design, that's the problem. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> How cool was that? And that was right here. This is like five meters from the vehicle. That was just like awesome. <laughs> I'm just going to turn around and see if we can keep following these cats. Yes. We've just got another hyena coming in. Don't think it's Corky. These cops are not stopping. They're not, don't you even think about it. Oh, very much a communal day, and the cubs have run inside. Look, submission, complete acts of submission here, also marking territory at the same time. <laughs> Greeting ceremony about to commence. I think our car smells wonderful, but it's attracting a lot of attention. <laughs> oh, my hyenas are nice and calm here, but it appears there's some hyenas chasing Shudulu. Well, these particular ones are making nuisance of themselves. There are three of them here, and they've just chased poor old Shudulu up a tree. There she is. I thought for a moment she might have a kill up there, but she doesn't. Oh, she's just so lovely. I love the colour in her eyes. Oh, that's so pretty. Leopards are really scared of getting injured. Because if they get injured, they can't hunt. So that's an absolute disaster for them. So it's not like a hyena which can take a risk. Because if a hyena takes a risk and gets injured, it can still hunt. But a leopard that gets injured will not eat. Oh, 
Morgan, I think let's go in as close as we can here. Just beautiful. She's watching the hyenas which have walked off. And she's just got the very last bits of light that there are in her eyes and that's why they're shining so bright like that. Naturally there's a stick in the way because there must be, always. <laughs> Gotta have a couple of sticks. It really is quite astounding. John, the safari will continue until six o'clock. And so it will be dark in this part of the world, but where Dylan is in the Kalahari, it won't be dark yet, so yes and no. Very unsatisfying answer. It will definitely be dark at Pinda, and dark here, and at Angala, and Pridelands, probably darker even a little bit before it's dark here. those hyenas leave her alone yeah George and Jack she's just wonderful looking and you know I'm very poor at identifying leopards say that hand on heart but she's pretty distinctive this one five five spot pattern and very distinctive eyes The guys behind me saw a leopard called Shidula this morning on some Bambili and they're deeply concerned that this leopard is this far. So I'm just going to go and have a quick chat with them to confirm it. And you head off to Angala. So this young male decided to get up and now, of course, not shy of the camera at all, he decided to move around and basically he's right in front of or he's between us and the carcass so the young uh, sister got down and she moved around and she's just decided to lay like lie down behind us and of course we thought maybe he's going to go down to the carcass if we give it some time i think that's exactly what he's doing now see the, the direction that he's moving in so that's towards the carcass it's just you can see he's, he's stopped for a little second there now moving again now if we focus on that carcass imagine if we can just get him see there he's just going down right in front of us we won't be able to see him anymore from here but he is going down straight straight towards that tree so let's focus on the carcass imagine if we can get him where he tries to maneuver remember also he's he's a lot heavier than his sister so the chances are if she's put it up at the at the branch at the top i wonder if she specifically placed it there because it's going to be harder for him to maneuver his weight around that little branch so i think while we're going to spend some time here and see if this young male eventually gets up to where the carcass is. We're going to send you across to see how hyenas would interact with one another. I am just having the best time in the Bele here, who is Pretty's daughter, Swazi's sister. 
She was born in September 2018, so coming up for two. Still a youngster, still a sub-adult, not sexually mature. Just tried to eat my shoe. <sighs> Oi, what are you doing? There's a lot of rough play here. But Ribbon is very accepting of Indebele. Pretty's, well, Pretty's no longer with us, and Pretty was high-ranking, which means that Indebele probably is in a good position as long as she acts submissive to Ribbon. Now, I got a good genital look and I got some photos that are a bit graphic, but I think we do have two boys and one. <laughs> The spot pattern of one is much more visible than the other. One is still quite dark. And Ribbon's just sleeping through all of this. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy there's action at the day and I've been here three or four days in a row and nothing, nothing has been happening. But all of a sudden, everybody's around. Butterfly, good to hear from you. I agree, this is just a bundle of joy. And Debele, we worried about we were worried about her some time ago. But she seems to be very much back in with the clan, loving the cubs. She's no threat to Ribbon, she's young. The cubs seem to love her, that's for sure. Swazi will be in camp. I was making tea last night and he wandered into the kitchen. Yes. Swazi has really, really taken a shine to our camp. And he really doesn't fear humans. Oh, ouchie. Ouch. It is definitely play, but it looks like it could border on painful there in the belly. Ribbon's probably thankful that there's someone else to entertain these two bundles of trouble. No, don't leave, girl. Where are you going? Ah, oh, Lara Moore, good to hear from you as well. Yes, this is very rough, isn't it? Rough play, shall we say? But I guess that's how the hyena cubs learn. Hyenas, oh. <laughs> hyenas are incredibly resilient. They have to be strong. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm really, really hoping that we might see signs of Corky. So I'm just going to enjoy these two for now. We've just taken a moment to appreciate the moon. It's not quite full. I think that'll be tomorrow night, so something to add to the cards for the sunset safari. I'm still really wanting to line the moon up nicely with an animal. That is really a dream shot, but we did try and work it earlier um, to have this moon rising between a dead tree, but it didn't quite work. It worked a little while ago, but that's actually not why we're sitting here, even though it is nice to stop and look at the moon, is that there is a lioness that's laying in the grass, but you can't see her. So we're on lioness watch duty, but I shall entertain you with other ways. So the reason why I'm not going to just go off to where she is, she's quite nervous. It's that young lioness that we've seen before. Can you see her? Gert says he can see her. No. Oh, she's there somewhere behind the bushes but we're waiting for her to sit up but you might remember her she was with the two young males on the buffalo kill that we had a few weeks ago anyways i went up onto the basalt ridge to go and have a look if i could figure out what aloes they are and anyways the elephants have been climbing around up on that ridge and there were quite a few aloes that were pulled out of the ground like this you can see this is the root of an aloe now i'm sure we get a whole bunch of different species of aloes that uh, grow around here I suspect that this is a Krantz aloe, um, which is quite typical. So I just sort of brought all the bits and pieces of this one that had been pulled out of the ground, unfortunately, and this, the whole root was snapped off, so there was no chance that it was going to grow again. It looked like it's happened in the last day or so, and we know the elephants like to hang around up there. Then um, 
The other thing is, oh, sorry, I'm sure you want to have a look at the flowers. So I thought we'd have a look at the flowers so you can see it. They're very pretty, filled with nectar. Now, aloes at this time of the year are, are probably one of, are you struggling with, okay, Lynn, how can I make help you? Over there. Gert is struggling to make, the, uh, I don't know how to make it work. Okay, wait, let me put a book. Huh? There. Sorry, everybody. It's just very difficult to sometimes find focus and sometimes the cameras don't want you to do the things that we want them to do. So they are the beautiful flowers. So <laughs> so it's quite amazing um, how the, the nectar and pollen of this plant is going to keep a lot of the different bird species going. It's not really sustenance in terms of food. They're not going to be getting any protein or fat out of it, but energy is something that they'll be able to get. So I've been watching uh, lately while I was on leave, uh, uh, black-headed orioles, um, my goodness, a whole bunch of weaver bird species coming through, feasting on this, forktailed drongos, all the starlings, and even though they don't have specially designed bills, uh, like the sunbirds do to, to sort of probe into that lovely flower and drink up the nectar. They simply, what they would do is they kind of just, I'm just trying to show, they kind of like just sliced into it like that and opened it up and, and then would feed on it that way, uh, which was quite interesting. But it was really entertaining and I'm sad I didn't have my camera with me because all the birds had orange heads and I know I've told you the story about how I was called the worst birder ever when I was training to become a guide. Uh, tough love that. And... I couldn't identify a fork-tailed drongo because it had an orange head and I saw it again with a couple of different bird species and that made me giggle. But that is not why I collected this plant. Firstly, I wanted to ID it, so I'll confirm if it is in fact um, the Kranz aloe at some point. But another thing that's really interesting with aloe plants is I'm sure all, all of you at some point, especially oh, men and women, um, would have used some kind of beauty product with aloe vera in it. Now, we don't have aloe vera in South Africa. We've got aloe ferox, which is bitter aloe, which is the same. It doesn't occur up here, but you can get it in the um, sort of where I'm from, the Eastern Cape of South Africa and along the coast. But you can see on the inside, it's like sort of this jelly substance. If you squeeze it, uh, it's been sitting in the car for a while, so it's probably not doing as well. But you can see there, this uh, sort of gel stuff comes through and that's what they use for all, all the sort of beauty products. It's really good for burns and blisters, um, uh, sort of any open wounds, um, which is really, really quite nice. Now you can't eat it. It tastes very bitter, the inside piece, but there is a aloe, I think it's aloe striata, coral aloe. I'm not sure if the names have changed since, but that you can actually eat. You just peel back this sort of outer part and then eat the middle bit, which is normally very, like I said, very bitter. And it tastes like a watered down cucumber. And that's one of the nicest, or well, the only sort of edible aloe that you can just sort of eat. I don't know how I've, <laughs> I cannot tell, oh no, I cannot tell you how disgusting that is, like it's really horrible and, what, oh, I want to do that, what I, what happened to me as a kid, I used to bite my nails and I used to get that, put on my nails so that I wouldn't bite it, don't ever do that again, I'm so sorry, that's so terrible, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever done in my life and I'll never do it again. Okay, I'm going to send you across to somewhere else where it's a lot prettier and you don't have to look at my face. <laughs> so our two young male lions have jumped out of their marula tree and we've followed them into this patch of long grass. But before we show you the lions, have a look at this magnificent scene. We are overlooking the plains of the far south of Ambion Pinda, looking off to the mountains out to the west. And if we just look down a little bit closer to the vehicle and go into infrared, you will be able to see that we've caught up with all five of the young male lions of the Biola Pride. And they seem to be making their way back towards a bit of a ravine and this is remember earlier i said that their mothers had left them to go hunting and apparently that happened sometime this morning speaking to the other vehicles that were in the area so it looked like these youngsters took themselves for a little bit of a walk walking around exploring and playing 
but now they've come back to more or less the spot where their mothers left them just so that when the lionesses do come back they'll be able to find them pretty easily and without too much of a hassle how magnificent is that though oh lions in the long grass with a gorgeous gorgeous horizon in the distance and now it's a waiting game for these little guys they're going to have to wait until their mothers come back and whether these lionesses are successful tonight or not they probably will come back either sometime late tonight or to early tomorrow morning they'll come and gather their youngsters up and lead them back to the kill if they were successful or otherwise rest for a bit before trying again to hunt Peter you're saying that it's crazy how long this grass looks Peter it is pretty long um, it's probably about maybe waist height a little bit below waist height maybe about 80 centimeters long and it's amazing how easily these lions just melt into it I mean if they were lying flat now they're looking at us with their ears facing towards us so we can see them pretty easily but if they were lying flat and we drove past we'd never know that they were here all right we're going to leave our young lions to their waiting for the evening and we're going to see what else we can find for you in the dark here but while we do that let's go and see what nikki's leopard is up to at Ngala. Damon and Emma Pinder, we've gone into infrared as well. So the one that's now currently feeding on that carcass is that young male we saw earlier. So he went down and he actually um, stepped on the branch just below the carcass and he's using the bottom branch, which is a lot bigger and stronger uh, than the smaller one, which the female dragged the kill over and Tumbu to actually just hold his weight. And then he's now standing with his paws over the kill. Just see that? A very, very smart leopard. So the female thought she's going to put it just out of reach for him, but he decided, no, no, there's no way he's going to get to it. But just have a look. Now, his belly early on when he stood up and he walked around was pretty full. So I'm just thinking with him, um, being three leopards, of course, they want to make the most out of it and get as much as they can because they never know when the next meal is going to be. And so this young male also, because he is growing, he'll need to eat quite a bit. So he, whenever he can, he'll go back and eat as much as he can until eventually there's nothing left uh, before they leave this carcass. But I'll try and be quiet. I'm thinking we might even be able to hear some of the bones crunching or like the way that he might just cut through that skin to get to some of the softer bits of meat. So let's listen. So I think what we're going to do from here is we're just going to spend another couple of minutes with this a young male leopard and just appreciate it for what it is, watching it being full moon, listening to some of the um, birds slowly starting to creep in for the evening. And I think while we do that, let's send you across to Dylan at Tualakalari because apparently those chitar are moving. So mom seems to have abandoned her hunting attempt for the moment. She's still super alert and will definitely be hunting in the next short while. I just don't know if it'll hold out until we leave, but you never know. It's always worth sticking around. It's how adorable is that, eh? That mother cub bond is incredible.
Got a jackal calling behind us here. We can't see it. He's probably a hundred yards away, but a jackal calling very, very actively. That's what's drawn her attention. But that could also indicate... It either could indicate that that jackal can see her from wherever he is, or it's actually maybe watching something else. But you notice that immediately that jackal started calling. She was onto it. Super, super, super alert. I mean, and, you know, we focused on the cheetah, but you could get a, you could get leopard rocking up as well. Oh, we're going to head over to the hyena cubs. Well, we've still got a bit of light that side. Yes, I think it's time we might have to say goodnight to our little cubbies. <laughs> Ribbon is there, but she's wandering off. She's woken up, and Debele is still here. But she's, well, a sub herself to get technical. Oh, no, and Debele's coming back. About to walk in front of the car. Hello, girl. You're going to come and visit us in camp tonight? I'm sure you are. When it gets to this time of night, hyenas are primarily nocturnal, just like lions, just like leopards, which means they do sleep a lot during the day. And then they will, once that sun starts to go down, they will wake up. And that's Ribbon gone, and that's Indebele gone. So we will need to leave, I'm afraid, which is heartbreaking. We can give you one last view of the gorgeous scene, the termite man, the cup, and the full moon. Isn't that beautiful? BK also needs to go into IR now. So the picture is going to go from beautiful to still beautiful, but black and white. There we go. Okay. I don't really want to scare them by turning my engine on, but we do have a policy here that with cubs, you do not stay without an adult, and Ribbon's gone, and indebele has gone. So we must leave, and I'm sure as soon as I turn my engine on, they're going to scatter in. Bye, little ones. Just like I predicted, there we go. But we must leave, we can't break policy. So we're gonna get out of this area and we're gonna send you guys across to the cheetahs at Swallow. This, this jackal is still alarm calling behind us over here. Um, Mom is just now constantly on the alert looking around. So I'm not quite sure what's going on here. We just don't wanna move um, in case we disturb something. Because, I mean, it could get anything. It could be a leopard that's moving in from that direction. It could be a spotted hyena. It could be another cheetah. We don't know. But I think for us to spend time here is far more valuable than trying to move off on a... Well, it wouldn't be a wild goose chase. So it would be something other, some other species. But the fact that mom is very, very, very much aware of those jackals calling and that alarm calling, that tells you that there's something else going on down there. Provenov has asked, do you find leopards at Swallow? Yes, we do. Um, in fact, this particular area that we're in, whenever you're close to the mountains, it's very, 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 very good for leopard. We can actually hear wild dogs calling in the far distance. Far, far, far away. They've got this absolutely haunting, haunting hooting sound. The most incredible sound you'll ever hear. And it's like an eerie haunting sound. It's a beautiful, beautiful, soft, soft hooting. But they far, that sounds like somewhere way in that direction.
I love this time of, of day in the bush. There's always this like, like sense of expectation. Things are starting to wake up. You know, all the all the night things. Even Jandre is waking up now. Jandre. 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 <laughs> But you see how this cat's looking around? She's very, very, very much alert. Yes, I'd would, it would be mind-blowing if something else came popping along now. Ah, the colours, eh? Yep, Butterfly says the call of the wild is precious. It really is, eh? For all you uh, book fundies out there, that's the title of a well-known book by a guy called Jack White from many, many years ago, The Call of the Wild. So we are just waiting here to see if Shidulu doesn't pitch up at the water hole at Galago Pan. This is, she headed into the block that leads down here, but it is so impenetrable that I, in fact, did not even consider trying to drive in after her, for I would have lost an eye, broken the car again, almost certainly. Excuse the noise, I'm just getting a spotlight on. Now we can be quiet and listen to the sounds of the evening. indeed and it's been quite obliging to sit here on what looks like a knob thorn because I thought it would have flown away by now but you can't really see too much of it just its rear end but it is in fact a pearl spotted owlet it's quite nice it's actually a really cool angle of its talons and of its feet not a, a view that you get to see so these birds typically are active during the day but this crepuscular period so the last of the light is a really really good hunting hour so they will hunt at night as well um, but you'll normally see them perched in a tree and darting down into the grass or leaf litter during the day now it's very focused but it's looking down at something so it hasn't moved and it keeps sort of jittering its head around quite a bit so there must be something that has caught its interest please can you turn around little bird because you were so beautiful just a moment ago I wonder what it's looking at. There's not that many insects around at the moment, so I don't know if it's maybe a moth or 
maybe a grasshopper. But look at those feet. It looks like it's wearing shoes that are about 10 sizes too big for it. And they can, and sometimes we'll catch small mammals, so mice and even some small birds, uh, uh, smaller birds too. As you can imagine, if this little thing over here were to catch a bushveld gerbil, for example, phew, it would be almost the size of it. Got really, really big feet. It would be very nice if it does fly down and catch something and we can watch it eat. It would be great success. It's actually been a very pleasant afternoon out here on safari. Lots of action all round. No one you want to turn. Linda Poli, my old friend, yes. I'm glad that you enjoy these birds. They are they are lovely. Sorry, that's just me shuffling around, taking the spotlight off it. It's also quite pretty with the sky. It almost looks like it's blue. Come on, turn around just one time for us. We don't always get to see them. We've been seeing a lot of southern white-faced owls. Not so many barred owlets. But there's also a pair of pill-spotted owlets that lives in a knobthorn. There we go. Knobthorn tree above my tent back at the eco-training camp. And they sing their hearts out all night long and all day long. I actually don't know when they go to sleep. And you see there how it's moving its head side to side, side to side. There it goes, darted down. Oh, it's just flown to the middle of the tree. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. So kind of in there, you can just see the branch moving around. So that's where the owl is. It's going down. If I stay like that, I'm going to drive forward. Sorry, so I'm just, sorry for the shakiness there. I can see it moving around, so I'm just seeing if I, if we kind of go around the tree. Oh, there it is. Do you see it? Just a little bit lower down to the right. There we go. Just fluffing its feathers. Sorry, I couldn't have parked any worse with all the branches. Samantha, ooh, a live kill, almost. I don't think it was quite successful, but it's now trying to hold onto this flimsiest twig. Come on, little bird, you're small, but you're not that light. But perhaps a... <laughs> but perhaps a little bit of a better branch to sit on. There it goes. <laughs> that was quite a nice sighting. It did look like it was a bit out of its depth there with flying. I wonder if it was a young owl. Nah, I don't think it was. It was quite funny. I think it just chose the wrong branches to drive on. Oh, bush baby. This is exciting. Okay, I'm going to drive a bit forward. That was quite good timing. There's a bush baby in front of me. You can't see, but in that tree. Now, every time I've had bush baby sightings here, they've always been really fantastic. So I'm just going to try and sneak. Don't you dare jump out of that tree, bush baby. I'm going to do the sneak attack, the roll on in. And then I have to remember that Chat is a lot higher than I am. And there's one branch here. Can you see it, Chat? It's just up there. Oh, yes, we should get a really good view of it. There we go. Ooh. There we go. There it is, just sitting in another knobful. So there we have a little lesser bush baby. So this seems to be where it's all happening tonight for the smaller creatures. Again, I like to eat insects. Sorry, I'm going to rest my hand and keep the uh, torch a bit stiller now. But I'm going to have to change its diet quite a bit and feed on some gum. I'm sure that well, there's lots of actually acacia species of trees, uh, or vicelia, trees that are around here now, um, and they exude the most tasty gum. Don't eat an aloe, little bush baby. I'm telling you from experience, that is the most vile thing, and I don't know why I did that. <laughs> that was a, it's one of the dumbest things I've done t t this year. We used to do it all the time. We used to do it to kids on safari. It was always like a big joke between the safari guides, but it doesn't taste very nice. I almost got sick. Also looking for something to eat. See that? So focused. Not even bothered by us. Not even a teensy tiny bit. I wonder if I put my foot on the clutch. No. I thought we'd be able to maybe roll forward a little bit and just get underneath that branch. So I wonder what's... You know, there's not like there's any flowers or anything on these trees that's going to be attracting it to insects. Give it a few more months, coming September when this tree does, or they could start getting flowers, then you might find lots of insects being drawn to the lovely white-scented flowers. Oh, that bush baby did a big yawn. And then it could be a little bit easier in trying to guess as to where to find things like bush babies and genets 
they'd probably hang around in those areas a little bit more. But this one has just definitely woken up. Another thing that Gert and I have been trying to show you, and we will continue to try and do it this week, is that we found and fallen over knobthorn tree that um, is housing some bush babies. So maybe tomorrow morning, Gert, we must go there and then just see if we can find them and get them poking their heads out of their hole. Because pretty much the time we go on safari, they're heading back um, to their little cavity to go to sleep. Obviously, this one is waking up. Lisa, I don't know. I see. I, sometimes I have like the most bizarre luck. Uh, I, I have really good bush baby sightings as well. Um, so they don't normally sit very still. They're very busy. And also, I'm surprised that there's just one here. There have been so many around. So obviously, the mothers with, I think, the infants ah, are going to groom itself. But one time I had this really cool sighting um, where it was two bush babies and they were they looked like they were dancing on a dead leadwood out in the open and they were so close and I went to take a picture and I didn't have my memory card in my camera which was very upsetting and but at least all the uh, people that had come on one of the eco quests with eco training this was last year sometime they got the most magnificent pictures and I was of course very envious of the whole thing but at least they enjoyed it which is the most important thing even though I was not too chuffed with myself. Not my brightest moment again. I seem to have a lot of these. <laughs> right. There isn't much light left here, so I can only imagine um, that there isn't much left at Pinda, but off we go to see the last of the cheetah. No, not Pinda. Swalu. <laughs> We have just, we haven't lost the cheetah. We are very, very, very close to them. We're just making a loop around the front so we can get a, a nice clear visual there for you. She's gonna cross the road, um, so I don't wanna miss that. Just give us one second, one second. We're nearly there, we're nearly there. Okay, so she should be at, coming out at about 11 o'clock to us now, give or take. We're just going to move across here and see if she actually cuts across our front here. Yeah, we got them just on our right here. Okay, there we go, coming across us now. Watch her, watch her, watch her. Wait for it. I lost that, but I think everyone's enjoying this. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, that is the best. That is the best, best, best. And here's number three that's just popped out as well. Are you going to go catch up with mom? Go on. Go on. Go on, little one. There was a very, very wise jackal that trotted out in front of them earlier. And, um, but I think when he saw them, he skedaddled. He was like, yeah, we're not going to hang around for this. Ah, oh, this is so exciting. Just, this is the way to end the day, eh? <laughs> Richard says that was perfectly timed. I had nothing to do with that. That was the cheetah that did everything there. And Jandre managed to get it on camera. I'm just going to go back a fraction now while we're here. Just maybe we see him. We're not going to go through here after them. It's just nice to just look at that beautiful setting there. And maybe we can see them out in the distance. But what a way to end the day. This is, these are the kind of evenings that I enjoy. I think I enjoy every evening, but this is just brilliant. Eh? Yeah, and by the sounds of it, yeah, our colleagues had some really, really good stuff down in their areas as well. Um, yeah, we were hoping for maybe slightly more hunting action, but I'm not complaining what, with what we had, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of little animals out there, little antelope that also aren't complaining about, about uh, cheetah not being too active. Yeah, well, but again, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. I mean, it's always good having you with. Uh, we really enjoy the comments 
you know, the questions that come through, some are fun, some are like really deep, some are interesting. It's just all good stuff. And yeah, from our side, tomorrow is going to be another day out on the African savannas yeah, in the Kalahari. And yeah, please just stay safe tonight. Go read up, think of some more cool things to chat with us about tomorrow. Have a good rest, stay safe, and we'll see you tomorrow.